This was a long time ago before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a mom in my early 30s who had just driven our kids to the pediatrician. The Macon, Georgia doctor's office was an hour away from our home, and I was just taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three years old, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last two appointments of the day, and we were very grateful. The doctor had just built a new building off a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car, a black Jeep Cherokee that we had owned for two years, was one of the only four or five cars in the parking lot when we got there. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we waited, saw the doctor, paid, and finally exited back outside. Mine was the only car left in the lot, as I loaded the children into their car seats for our trip home. But as the receptionist locked the front glass doors, my car somehow wouldn't start when I turned the key. There was just an odd clicking noise. Gathering the children once again, I knocked on the door until someone allowed us back in and asked to borrow their phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book, and the man said that he would come but that it might be a bit. I found one in the phone book. The man said that he would come right away but that it might be a bit for him to get there, so I told him my location. I left to go out back to the car rolled down all the windows, and loaded the children back into their seats once more as we waited. Soon, we watched as all the lights were turned out in the building again, and everyone left, their cars departing one by one from behind the building somewhere, leaving us now completely alone in the parking lot. As it was still light out, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot, etc. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to be quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot pretty soon. A man got out of his pickup, smiled and nodded to me, said he was going to raise the hood. He was middle-aged and a bit scruffy, but quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes look that way, especially after the end of a long shift. I was grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine, but he seemed to be taking quite a long time checking the connections. I longed for him to just grab some jumper cables, but he never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong. Oh, it's uh, just a loose wire, not the battery. He continued with whatever he was doing. I couldn't see his face at all from where I was sitting, but his hands were slightly visible through that long horizontal slit between the windshield and the raised hood as we waited. More than once, he said that it was merely a loose wire, and that if I would just come up here real quick, he would show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of smiling and shaking my head, saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything, as I didn't know anything about cars. I just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat, again just waiting for the inevitable signal to try and start the ignition that was surely coming any moment. At one point, I even remember thinking that he was definitely flirting as he spoke, but I was trying above all to be polite and kind, as he was indeed helping us. We were hot and tired and miserable, and truthfully, I was distracted with the kids. Oddly enough, he began to start to sound a little frustrated with me, because I wouldn't come up and look at the engine with him. I remember thinking that I certainly didn't want to make him mad to where he'd leave us all alone, with the sun sinking so quickly. And then the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled into that desolate parking lot. As it did, the nice man working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran over to his truck, started it, and drove off very quickly, without even saying a word of goodbye. I was confused and a little anxious when he did this, because I didn't know who was now arriving. 
I even remember feeling a little frightened that he had suddenly left me there alone with two little ones, completely defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me now? It certainly seemed the southerly gentleman thing to do. I looked around and was very aware once again that there were no visible cars on the road, no homes or businesses nearby, and the sun was setting very quickly. As this new, also unmarked pickup pulled in next to me, I got out of the car once again, this time a little more apprehensively. Upon exiting, though, the man immediately introduced himself. He said his name, and his voice seemed to match who I had spoken to on the phone much earlier. He then actually called me by my name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and stared towards the road, pointing and asking who the man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I smiled back in surprise and told him, Well, I don't know. I thought all this time that he was you. We both laughed slightly as he grabbed his jumper cables, walked to the front of my car, raised the hood, and started his work. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that with luck the air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly, once again checking the children. While listening to the familiar words, try it, I had my back completely turned, when he surprised me by coming over to the driver's side door. In the strangest voice, he said, Uh, ma'am, is this yours? When I looked into his hands, he was holding a long, thin, dagger-looking device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and was covered in reddish rust, yet on one end it had tiny circular finger holes, as if it was a mix of a long, thin sword and scissors, oddly combined. I remember being amazed but not frightened as I asked him where he had found them. Uh, they were under the hood, he replied. I just said matter-of-factly that I had never seen them before. Oh, how weird. Those things have been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years? I shook my head in surprise. He continued to stand there and stare at them, unbelievingly. He looked oddly pale, too, like he couldn't find the right words to speak for a bit, just continuing to stare at the unusual object. Honestly, I didn't care one bit about it. All I could think of was getting the car going, letting me pay him and the cost, and leaving. He didn't say anything else, just quickly set them aside on the curb, started his truck, and then signaled for me to start the Jeep. When it immediately caught, my little three-year-old cheered. Grateful, I quickly turned on the air conditioner full blast, rolled up all the windows, and aimed the air vents towards the back seat. I reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him, so I could hear the amount now owed. With both of our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side. Instead of handing me the bill, though, he irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up that weird object once more. Ma'am, he said slowly, I want you to look at these one more time. He held them out for closer inspection. And this time, I moved a bit closer and actually really looked. In his hands, the item appeared incredibly large, possessing an almost bayonet-looking quality, except for the strangely small two loops on one end. I'd never seen anything like it before, and told him so. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, as if trying desperately to make me understand something that was somehow still going over my head. Ma'am, these weren't hidden somewhere in the engine. They hadn't been there very long at all, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there recently. I shook my head no and half smiled. But they're obviously very old and rusty. He pointed more closely and replied, Yeah, but see how sharp these are? They look like they were just sharpened. When I looked down, I noticed that he was right. The long, skinny, dagger-like shape was unusual, but by far the oddest quality was just how sharp it appeared to be. The edges at the tip where the rust had been removed were gleaming silver. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm real glad I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me to call the police right away when I got home, and then asked me where I wanted the item. I didn't touch it. I didn't want to take it at all, but I released the back window so he could place it inside. We both left the lot together, 
him turning one way, me turning the other towards a small winding highway that would lead home, still about an hour away. I did indeed contact the Macon police the moment we arrived home, and I got the children inside safely. Although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like thing to them later. The officer I spoke to said it sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears for my description and measurements on the phone, which I found quite disturbing as you can imagine. I remember wondering how he would even know that, why he would say that. I tried so carefully not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping they might be able to lift some prints or test it for blood if they wanted, but the story just seemed to bore him a bit, and he didn't seem interested. His attitude insinuated that as long as there was no longer an emergency, it was of no importance now. At the very end of the call, as if to wind things up, he did say it sounded as if I was very lucky, that I might want to keep them for a few days just in case someone from his office got back with me later, but that was all. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper and placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house, where they remained for several more years untouched until we finally moved away, and finally not wanting to bring them across several states, threw them in the trash. Around that time, though, if you look through old news reports, women were going missing all over Georgia. Some bodies were eventually found, but others remain missing to this very day. I've often wondered what would have happened if the service station attendant hadn't arrived when he did, if my children would still have a mother, if I would still have my son and daughter, if I would have missed all these years with them. I guess I'll never know, but I learned something pretty important about myself that day. I had always felt that I was very aware of my surroundings, pretty good at reading people and staying safe. But because I was exhausted, tired and hot, stranded in a different city, my common sense and intelligence simply left me for a bit and weren't working at all at the time. Many of my friends and family still think that our car trouble that day and my lack of awareness could have easily cost us our lives. Please be forewarned. This is the type of story that makes your skin crawl in a way that makes you beg for it to be untrue. I wish that were the case. I'm a 34-year-old petty officer in the United States Navy and was stationed at Pearl Harbor. When we got our orders, my wife was excited to move to Hawaii. In tropical beaches, endless summer, how could we not love life? Besides, it was a great opportunity to get our boys, ages 10 and 13, outdoors and away from their Xbox every now and then. I'd recently remarried. My wife is a gorgeous 35-year-old blonde bombshell. We'd met in high school journalism. She was the editor of the school paper, and I took the class because I thought it was an easy A. When we were in our 20s, she'd been a model. Mostly promo work and music videos, but some more prestigious things like Playboy and print ads. At the time, I was a touring rock musician. It took us years to finally end up together. But here we are, living our best lives in paradise, until last September. Early September 2019, my wife was away at a retreat, and I had to return home urgently for a family emergency. Something was off, and we could both sense it. We all decided to return home early, so we got a space on a military flight as soon as one became available. By the time our flight had landed, we were completely exhausted. Fortunately, we lived in a privatized military housing just outside the base. However, as we drove up to our house, my wife noticed my bicycle sitting in front of the garage. You left your bike outside. Were you getting some exercise before you left? I hadn't touched my bike at all since we'd first moved to Hawaii. Something was wrong. I instructed the kids to stay behind in the car and immediately unlocked and slid open our garage door. The garage was completely trashed. It was apparent from the start that we'd been robbed. The kids were now standing outside the car. It had been a long flight, and they needed to use the restroom. I yelled at them nervously to get back in the car and rushed to the front door. I slid the key into the front and began to push it open. 
to find a tall, dark figure peering through the crack and holding it shut. Jet-lagged and tired, I wondered if I had the wrong house. My wife began to scream at him. Who are you? What are you doing in our house? I came to my senses finally and pushed the door open. It was a complete stranger. We had no idea who he was or what he was doing there. He was a Puerto Rican man in his early 20s, about 5 foot 11 with short brown hair. This is my house. You have the wrong house. He insisted as he attempted to shut the door on me once again. He was wearing all of my clothing and my shoes. What did you do to my cat? My wife continued to interrogate the man who stood in the doorway preventing us from getting in. I rushed into the garage and grabbed an eight pound sledgehammer, the only thing we had available for our defense. I screamed at the man to get out of the house as my wife ran and called the neighbors for help. They just stared as I confronted the man with the sledgehammer, kids standing on the lawn, but nobody called. I yelled at them once again to get back in the car and lock the doors, and this time they promptly did. Finally, my wife was able to get a hold of her cell phone and call the police. There's a man in our house. We don't know who he is. Please help. Within a few minutes, several cop cars arrived. I threw down the sledgehammer and yelled to the officers and pointed at the intruder. As they searched our home, we gave the police our statements, and the intruder was arrested for burglary. After the home was cleared, we were instructed to take the kids somewhere safe and do an inventory to identify what was damaged or missing. We were completely shaken up. It took a couple of hours to drop the kids off and compose ourselves before we returned. Our entire home was completely trashed. It was demoralizing. All our belongings were thrown around our house. Pictures and items that were stored in boxes in the garage were taken out and put on display. He'd even built a dog kennel that we had in storage and locked up our cat and tried to turn it vegan by feeding him only dried mangoes and water. I waded through the kitchen. It smelled. There were pots and pans filled with human feces, urine, and God knows what else. My wife called me from our bedroom upstairs. James, you need to come look at this now. On our bed, an old MacBook was open next to my combat knife and various other personal objects. The Omnivore Trials, a rehabilitation for rat-like people. The stranger had left about a dozen pages of notes on our old computer. These notes detailed my wife and children as his test subjects, stating that they were a species called omnivores. He planned to surgically alter them to become a new species called Ezekiel's. We searched our other devices. The web history revealed he had viewed many videos on how to surgically remove arms, perform anal reconstructive surgery, and perform gender reassignment surgery. He detailed his notes and his plan to neuter my wife and how he had been watching our children play in the backyard. His desired outcome was for them to be transgendered. He wrote that his transformation was painful, but he hoped that they would be receptive and he saw them as some of the most beautiful creatures he'd seen. He believed that he was going to make them even more beautiful. He even wrote an entry about how he believed a child as the Antichrist and how that child was meant to reveal to the world the wrongdoings of government and the evils of society. His grotesque and bizarre obsession with my kids had us deeply concerned. With the entire house trashed, he'd only managed to clean the kids' bedroom. He placed a photo of them that was originally downstairs on the TV stand in their room. It made us sick to our stomachs. He'd even listed the surgical equipment he would need, researched medications, and attempted to procure a hospital bed. I paced around the house furiously while my wife was in a panic. I glanced down at the kitchen counter, and I noticed condiment cups with a liquid inside that had post-it notes. They read, Omnivore's Eye Drops and Omnivore's Skin, which were to the side of various prescription medications laid out. He had made serums to drug us. I called my chief, and he instructed us to lock ourselves in the car and call the police. When the police arrived, they told us there was nothing they could do. They would not take the computer or the drug serums as evidence. 
Naturally, we were upset. As I showed him the notes on the computer, we noticed he had recorded a video as well. It was a 47-minute transformation video that discussed the cosmetic portion of his trials and went along with his manifesto. At this time, our neighbor came out and stated to the police that on Friday the 13th, she'd made a call to security and had witnessed a domestic disturbance between him and a woman. The police noted that there was a female suspect still at large. We insisted to the police that they needed to take the evidence in the home and that additional charges needed to be filed. He's already charged with a felony. What more do you want? This set us off, and my wife and I began to berate the police officer and his partner for their incompetence. Our bedroom, furniture, and clothing were destroyed. There were bottles of urine placed throughout the house. Various items were stained with what appeared to be semen, and there were feces smeared all over the bed and chairs. With that and the blatant threats left in his notes, how could they not see that this wasn't a mere burglary? Eventually, we calmed down, and the officer suggested we email the detective digital copies of the notes and video, along with screenshots of the web history during the time the intruder was in the home. Unsafe. Violated. Angry. We left the house as we did not feel it was okay to return with the suspect still at large. Unfortunately, the privatized military housing company refused to provide us with alternative safe housing, so the four of us spent the next few days sleeping on sofas at various people's homes. The following week, we received a phone call from the victim's advocate at the prosecuting attorney's office. The intruder had been placed on supervised release without bail. Naturally, he violated the terms of his release and burglarized a Buddhist study center. He was committed to a state hospital. He's now been deemed unfit to stand trial. When I was 16, I worked in a coffee shop. It was my first job, and I really liked working there. I was a young girl, so I would occasionally get a creepy comment from some random old man. I could sometimes tolerate it, because I really needed the paycheck, but this time it went way too far. I usually worked from 2pm to 10pm, and those were long, feverish hours. There were two stations to switch between in the coffee shop, one for coffee and pastries and one for ice cream. So I would be spending hours going back and forth between the two stations. I would often work with a girl who was in her early 20s named Kelly. She was really pretty, and often colored her hair crazy colors, but she had the maturity of a freshman in high school. She wasn't much help on these long nights, despite being the supervisor. She also had a huge ego for someone who made me do all the work, and then expect the tips to be split. For about a week now, I'd noticed the same man frequenting the place. He'd come in with a laptop, order a hot green tea, and then sit down and browse the internet for hours. I didn't pay any attention to him at first. About the third day in a row of him coming in, he made small talk with me at the counter. He asked for my name, because I wasn't wearing my name tag. I told him, and he smiled and said that he knew my mom. I fake smiled and talked all giddy with my customer service voice. Then he asked my age. That made me uncomfortable, so I just said I needed to check on something in the back. I told Kelly that the customer out there was being creepy, and asked if she could take care of him. She told me I was being really paranoid, but she did me a solid anyway. I sat on my phone for about ten minutes, before going back out behind the counter. When I walked back out, I saw Kelly and this man were laughing and talking like old chums. He seemed to be flirting with her a lot. And then he looked up and saw me. He smiled all creepy again, winked, and then turned around to leave. I was disgusted, but decided to just get on with my shift. The next day, the man came back. He ordered his tea once again and then quietly went to sit at a table. I'm sort of a snoopy person, and I walked over to the ice cream area where I could get a good look at his screen. He was scrolling through some girl's Facebook photos, and she looked very young. Younger than me, even. He clicked on pictures of this girl in swimsuits and just stared at them. I was creeped out, and forced myself to ignore it. 
Eventually, he left, and once again, I forgot about it and continued working. Just as expected, though, he came back the very next day. He did everything he usually did, although I spared my eyes from his laptop screen this time. At around five, he was still just sitting around. He usually would have left by now, and even Kelly noticed his strange behavior. He came up to the counter, and I quickly walked over to assist him. He requested a cup of boiled water for some strange medication he claimed he was on. We had had a water machine, and to get it, I'd have to turn around. I didn't want to give him a show, so I backed up, grabbed a cup, and backed over to the machine. He seemed almost dissatisfied that I didn't turn around. I filled it up and walked back over to him, set it down in front of him. As he grabbed the cup, he made the most disgusting comment I've ever had said to me. Those leggings look a little tight on you. Are they tight? I didn't even emote. I just stared at him. He chuckled and said he was just joking, walked back over to his laptop. I went into the back and told Kelly that she needed to kick him out right away. She refused and said he was just being nice. I got upset with her and walked back out. I was too scared to tell him myself to leave. He ended up spending the entire day there, and when 10pm rolled around, I grabbed the keys and locked the doors. They're locked from the outside, but you can still open them from the inside if you're in there. This was usually my way of telling customers to get out in the nicest way possible, but the man didn't move. I brought the sign from outside back in and shut the door. He then piped up and asked what high school I went to. I ignored him and walked behind the counter, shut off a couple of lights to signal that we were closed. Kelly came out and saw he was still there, but she didn't even kick him out. She made small talk with him at the counter and even let him sample the ice cream. He offered her some strange white thing that looked a lot like a pill and claimed it was a mint. She declined. I was quietly counting the tips and splitting them, with the tills out. I felt very uncomfortable having our registers out with this creepy guy hanging around. He didn't make any more effort to talk to me, but I overheard the conversation he and Kelly were having. He asked her out, and she said no and that she had a boyfriend. He asked her what school she went to. She laughed and said she's 22. He said, Oh, I thought you were 15. And Kelly didn't laugh at that one. I was incredibly disgusted and grabbed my half of the tips and got my bag. I know I probably shouldn't have left Kelly there with them, but Kelly didn't take shit from anyone and she could definitely kick some ass if she wanted to. Plus, she was older than me. I said goodbye to Kelly and walked out to my mom's car and told her about the weird man. My mom doesn't tolerate that type of shit, so she swerved around and pulled up in the parking lot. She asked if the large white truck was his. I said yes, and she told me to stay in the car. Before she even got out to confront him, though, he came out and saw us. He smiled and waved, and started walking over. My mom backed right out and drove away, and told me what she knew about the man. My mom works at a bank, and he's a member. He would constantly try asking her out despite her being married, and always make inappropriate comments. My mom has a framed picture of me on her desk, and all the customers who come in can see it. He must have seen that and found me on Facebook, learned where I worked. We called the police when we got home and told them all about this man. They told us that they were looking for him and that they would call us back. Well, they found him pretty easy. He was arrested, but not for the harassment, for the fact that he had been banned from the premises for a year and wasn't allowed back. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car. The pandemic has also made me turn more to delivery apps in general anyway. So, the other day around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing quite a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food to arrive. Within just a few minutes, a driver accepted my order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was apparently on a bike, didn't have a profile picture, and also didn't have any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't very alarmed at all. I was almost sort of amused, like, oh wow, I guess I'm this person's first ever customer. 
Then, though, a full 30 minutes passed by, with no driver movement on the app. At this point, I thought something must be glitching out or the driver might be stuck somewhere. I contacted the support via the chat option, and they ended up assigning a new driver, because they couldn't reach the first one at all. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts to get a little bit weirder. The new driver was assigned in the exact same spot as the original driver was. They were also apparently on a bike and also had no profile picture. They had no prior deliveries as well. This driver's name was Lori. I let another 20 minutes or so pass by with no driver movement at all before I decided to message them myself. Uh, hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app showed that the driver had seen the message, but I never got a response. All this time, I was checking to see if Uber Eats was maybe experiencing some issues, but I couldn't find anything on the subject. At this point, though, while I was definitely weirded out, I was mostly just really hungry. I contacted support once again to request some assistance. They reassigned the driver once more and apologized for the inconvenience. Same deal when they tried to contact the driver. No response. Finally, a third driver was assigned in the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time, the name was Robert. Before I could react and go on about canceling the order at this point because I was getting tired of dealing with this, suddenly he had my food and immediately messaged me the following. Hello, have your food. What's your phone number? I responded right away with, I'm not super comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me on here. He responded once more. What's your number? Be there in 10. How old are you, by the way? At this point, the alarm bells are going off. I contacted support immediately to have the order canceled and get further assistance. I got connected with Uber's safety team, who informed me that the order had been canceled, I'll be refunded, and started taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I was giving the woman on the phone the info she needed, I was starting to calm down thinking this was just some creep playing a prank or something, when I suddenly heard a man's voice at the door. Miss Metal Gear 4 2069, I have your food. I can't even begin to describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the Uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well. Is that him? We already cancelled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open. The metal screen door was closed and locked but allowed us to see one another. I got a look at him, and when he saw that I was on the phone, he went immediately from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept demanding to know who I was on the phone with. At this point, I've started asking him to please leave because he was making me uncomfortable, but he just kept getting more and more angry. He started pounding on my door, grabbing at the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone was quite concerned, asking if I was okay. The man was still shouting, so I was basically in full meltdown mode at this point. I hurriedly closed the heavy door to lock it. The man was becoming borderline belligerent as he kicked at my door. The woman told me to hang up and call police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute later and back up to the sidewalk. For a moment, I thought he fucked off, so I finally finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman so she could finish submitting the report. Once she did, I called the police and told them what happened. They weren't exactly incredibly helpful at first since he didn't actually break in or put his hands on me. They told me to just call back if he came again and they would send an officer out. I ended up having to call them again and give a report plus full description of the man since he didn't end up actually leaving right away. Instead, he lingered around the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat. Apparently, they just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. That's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So, basically, this was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience. I wanted to share it and see if maybe anyone has ever experienced anything like this. Honestly, I'm pretty shaken up, and will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while after this.
This is going to be pretty tame compared to a lot of the great ones I've read here, but since it happened to me, I think it's pretty spooky. I'm definitely at least buying a doorbell camera ASAP. Now I'm writing this only a few hours after everything just happened. Now that I've calmed down a bit and the sun is coming up, I feel somewhat safer now. Last night I was laying in bed, reading a little before I went to sleep. I think it's important to clarify that I live on the outskirts of my town. It's still technically in town, but definitely right on the edge, off the highway that leads out of town and into a 15 mile long stretch of lots of country. Woods, fields, a few residencies, but mostly just open highway. So other than the other tenants in my actual apartment building, it's normally very quiet in my area. My building is a square with four apartments, and for each of us, our door simply faces out into the open. There's no lobby or foyer or anything. My door in particular looks out into a large field that goes up a hill. I don't remember the exact time, but sometime between 1 and 2 a.m., someone started randomly banging on my door. Now, this freaks me out at the best of times in broad daylight, but especially in the middle of the night. I nervously went to ask who it was. Some guy with a deep voice called through the door, claiming he was a police officer and that I needed to let him in. That's exactly what he said, too. I needed to let him in, not that he needed my assistance or that I needed to open the door. Luckily, I watch and listen to a lot of true crime stuff, so I got pretty suspicious real quick. I just got near instant alarm bells because he just couldn't tell me why I needed to let him in. He wouldn't tell me what I supposedly did either and never even asked what my name was. He also really didn't sound like a cop if you know what I mean. Obviously I was feeling creeped out so I called the real 911 to confirm there was actually an officer at my address. They pointed out right away that there was not. At this point I was freaking out. I kind of called out through the door that I'm on the phone with the police. The guy just kind of bangs on my door one more time then stops making noise altogether, I presume because he ran off at this point. They dispatched two cars to my apartment and the officers took a good look around. Unfortunately, the guy was long gone by the time they got there, and I'd never actually seen him, so I didn't have a description of him I could give or anything. The cops at least said two things to make me feel better though. One, they'd post more patrols in my area over Halloween weekend. And two, it was most likely a Halloween prank, because the bar down the street from my apartment had had a party, and it just closed not too long before this happened. The moral of the story is always trust your instincts, and remember that if you have any doubts about someone claiming to be a police officer, call 911 and confirm they're who they say they are. Dispatch and the officers who came tonight told me you will not get in trouble for making sure the person you're talking to is actually an officer. This also applies to situations where it's nighttime and dark, so you can't really see for sure if it's a real cop car behind you or not. If you see flashing lights behind you on a back road or a dark area at night, put on your hazard lights and call 911 first to make sure it's actually a cop car. You won't get in trouble, I promise. Better safe than sorry. This happened a long time ago. At the time, I was living alone in a first floor apartment. My girlfriend had been sick at the time and ended up in the hospital dealing with a rare disease. Thankfully, she recovered just fine from it. But during those weeks, my life was pretty much go to work, go to the hospital to be with her, then come back to the house for dinner and go to bed. This was a Friday night and I was all alone so I decided to distract myself by reading and watching some videos on YouTube. Hours passed by, and at 3 a.m. I was in bed with my iPad in hand, just about to fall asleep. Then I heard it. I knew that sound pretty well. You see, outside, right in front of my bedroom door, there was a long corridor that led directly to the kitchen. This apartment was in a building built in the 50s, and the kitchen door was really old and it became slightly bent. That meant that whenever you turned the doorknob to open the door, it would snap out of its place with a distinct clacking sound. And that was the sound I had just heard. A lot of thoughts ran through my mind in that exact moment. 
and I dreamt about it in a semi-sleeping state perhaps. Or maybe the sound was real, but what happened was that the doorknob internal mechanism broke and it opened by itself. Or, of course, maybe someone was in my house, and they had just opened the door. At this point, my heart was racing, and I started considering my options. I did have a broomstick next to my bed. You may ask why I had it there, and to be honest, I had it exactly because I lived alone. I thought one day I might be in a situation like this, where I would need a weapon. My girlfriend even used to tease me about it, but I guess my paranoia was now paying off in the most unfortunate of situations. I decided to grab the stick in one hand and grab my cell phone in the other. My plan was to open my bedroom door while calling 911, and if no one else was in the apartment, I would just apologize to the operator on the other end of the line and explain the situation. Back in those days though, my cell phone wasn't yet a smartphone. It did have this feature I found somewhat interesting though, even though I'd never used it. If you press this specific couple of keys, it would start ringing like someone was calling you. It was meant to be used when you wanted to simulate getting a call to get out of a boring conversation or tough situation. I clumsily pressed those keys and the phone started ringing. I quickly shut it up, but now it had become clear inside the apartment that I was awake. If someone was outside my bedroom, they had certainly heard it. What was going to happen now? I stopped for a few moments to observe my surroundings. I couldn't hear anything. It was dead quiet. I decided to continue with my plan. I dialed 911 with one hand and raised the broomstick with the other. I quickly shoved open the door. As soon as I'd done that, I saw someone sprint in front of me in the corridor and quickly go into the kitchen, closing the door behind them. Hey! I screamed and started pursuing, but a split second later I thought, stop, what if there's someone else in the apartment? What if another intruder sneaks up from behind or something? In front of me was that long corridor to the kitchen, but to my left was another that led to the living room and office. The office had the light on, so the intruder must have been in there, but I didn't know if he had company or not. I took a step back to the entrance of my room, so I wouldn't be able to be caught off guard. Sir, are you there? The 911 operator called me on the phone. I quickly explained to him what was happening, gave him my address, and he told me the police were on their way. It seemed they had a patrol car nearby, so all I had to do was wait. Then the operator hung up. The apartment was dead silent. I was terrified. There were only three things I had been able to notice about the intruder. He had a light-colored sweatshirt with black horizontal lines, dark hair, and he smelled really bad. In fact, the smell was still in the apartment, and I could still sense it. The police arrived after seven or eight minutes, which felt like ages. The apartment door was next to the bedroom, so I managed to quickly approach it and unlock the door to let them in. I explained what had happened to the police, and they said we should go through the whole apartment and check every single hiding place. There had been situations where a burglar had hidden themselves for a long period, even after the homeowners had called the police, only to later attack them. The apartment wasn't very big, so it was easy to conclude that no one else was hiding there. In the kitchen, it was obvious what had happened. It had these large windows that faced the back of the building, where we had a small community garden. I had left one of the windows open, and next to it on the outside, there was a large drain pipe along the wall. It seemed the intruder had used that pipe to climb my window and get in. The police left to go look around the neighborhood for someone matching the description of the sweatshirt I described. While they were gone, I could still smell that horrible odor the intruder had left in my apartment. After around 20 minutes, the cops came back. Seems they couldn't find anyone. The burglar was already long gone. Luckily, he didn't have a chance to steal anything while he was in there. But the audacity! I mean, he must have seen the light on in my bedroom through the edges of the door, and still he tried walking past it to steal something from my office. I didn't sleep well that night. In the morning, I went to the garden in the back to try and find any further clues about the intruder, but I couldn't find anything. A neighbor in the building next door was at the window, and I called out to her. I told her what happened, and she just smiled and said, Well, welcome to the neighborhood. We all have stories like that in this place. You should never leave your windows open. Maybe you should even consider getting some bars to protect them. 
The next day I bought a motion alarm and installed it in the kitchen. I never had another experience like that in that apartment, but to be honest, I never slept the same way in that bedroom, traumatized by those events. At night, I would fear hearing the sound of the kitchen door snapping out of its place once again. A few years later, I moved out into a larger apartment in another neighborhood. This time, though, it was on the seventh floor, so I didn't have to worry about intruders getting in through the windows. Pawn shops get a really bad reputation that they don't deserve honestly. Movies make it seem like it's easy to sell stolen goods there, and they make it seem like pawn shops are all dangerous, that only low-life people get loans at them, and that pawn shop workers are seedy and only interested in cheating people out of their money. My very first job was at a pawn shop, and I still work there today actually. I've been there for a good 14 years too. However, I did almost quit shortly after I began working there. I had this really frightening incident. When I was first hired at the shop, I was hired to work the overnight shift. I thought it would be pretty cool because it would be slow, and I could spend my time playing around on my Game Boy the entire time. Although there were definitely customers who came into the shop that late, there really weren't too many. Some were a little bit sketchy, I have to admit but they didn't actually come completely into the shop. There was a little foyer that was locked overnight, and we conducted transactions through a glass teller window. About a month after I had first started, I was there with one other employee. It was her lunch break, and she went and had something to eat in the back room. We were technically not supposed to leave the building at night, not even for our break. About the time that she went on her break, I saw a car pull up into the parking lot. We were the only business in the strip mall that was open that late, so I expected someone to come up to the shop to pawn something, but instead the car just sat there. Occasionally the driver would start the car, turn the lights on, let it idle for a minute or two, and then turn it off once again. Occasionally the driver would start the car, turn the lights on, let it idle for a minute or two, and then turn it off once again. I had no idea what he was doing, and I just thought it was really weird. I tried not to let it bother me, though. Finally, after a while, the man got out of the car. He walked with a slight limp. I remember that. He walked up onto the sidewalk right in front of the store. He looked through the door, but didn't reach for it. Instead, he walked away from the shop but not back to his car. He walked down the sidewalk of the storefront. After a few moments, I saw him walk back the other direction. He looked into the opening once again, but didn't indicate that he was going to come in at all. So yeah, this behavior was already really weird in setting off some alarm bells. Keep in mind though, this was my first job ever, and I had only been on the job for a month or so. I really wasn't sure what to do in this situation, or if I really even should be worried. The next time the gang came back, though, he came into the door. He walked right up to me, and he seemed very nervous. He asked me if I could let him into the store. I told him we didn't allow people in after hours. If he wanted to pawn something, he'd have to go on and do it through the window. He told me he didn't exactly want to pawn something. He wanted to pick a gold watch that he had on pawn. I told him he had to come back in the morning to do that, because our jewelry safe was on a time block, and we didn't do transactions like that overnight. He began getting extremely irritated with me. He told me he just needed his watch back, and that I needed to get it for him right now. The more I insisted that I couldn't, his irritation slowly began turning into rage. He started threatening me, first telling me he would call the cops and have me arrested for not giving him his property. Well, I knew that was a load of bull, because it just didn't work that way. When I told him as much, he threatened to break through the glass and get it himself. That was also impossible, and I told him that much as well. The man became extremely angry and started pounding on the window. His face was the deepest shade of red I had ever seen a human face get. I reached for the phone and told him I was going to call the police. When I said that, he cursed at me, ran out the door, got into his car, and drove away. 
I ended up not calling the police since he had already left. This happened at around 1.30 a.m. My co-worker came back soon after that. At about 3 a.m., I decided to finally go on my break. I decided I wanted to go and get some Taco Bell. I went to the back door and opened it. As I had the door partway opened, I looked up and saw the car from earlier parked in the back lot. I then noticed movement behind the door as I saw a hand grab for it immediately to hold it open. I pulled back, jamming the man's hand in the door frame. He screamed and let go of the door, allowing me to close it. He then began wailing, screaming and attacking the back door, demanding I open up and let him in or else he would kill me. This time I took the phone and did call the police. My boss was called in, and it turns out this guy had pawned a gold watch and never paid on it. He had been in during the day several times trying to get it back, but of course was turned down each time. I guess he thought there was some way he could get away with it at night, force it if he had to. Thank God he was wrong. So this happened in April of this year, 2018. Background. I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood, but the security isn't extremely tight. Sometimes the gates are left open, and anyone could piggyback off someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins, or other items being stolen from porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. So this particular Friday evening, I go to bed at about 2.30 a.m. For some odd reason, I was having trouble getting to sleep, so I put on a podcast to listen to and eventually started to doze off. I became aware of a noise that sounded like a clicking sound but it sounded like one of my upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zoned this out, as I was used to my neighbors staying up late on weekends. After about 30 seconds, I realized the noise was extremely repetitive and getting louder. Then I started focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it was coming from. Suddenly it hit me. It was coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leapt out of bed and headed to the foyer. I identified the noise right away. The lock mechanism was moving back and forth rapidly, like someone was trying to unlock the front door. I could hear that an object was inserted in the lock, and the person was jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turned around, headed to my bedside safe, and unlocked it with the combination. I pulled out my 357 SIG, load a 14-round magazine, and chamber in a hollow-point round. I head back to the door as I exit the bedroom, and I see the lock finally twist and unlatch. I immediately pointed my weapon straight ahead, knowing that if someone came through, I would have to make a split-second reaction. I decided that if someone came through the door, I would give them a momentary chance to retreat, but if they did anything other than that, or entered aggressively, I was going to shoot and ask questions later. They didn't enter, however, because I had also locked the deadbolt. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature, and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life-or-death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approached the door and looked through the keyhole, on the other side were three Asians, two men and one woman. All three were wearing hoodies, so it was difficult to make out their faces. The men had objects in their hands, but I couldn't make out exactly what. The two men were talking back and forth, probably trying to figure out why they can't open the door, even though they've successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman was also talking loudly behind the two men, such that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She was talking in another language. The only two words I can make out are Apartment 250. She kept repeating that over and over like a broken record. 
Upon hearing that, I started to wonder for a moment if maybe they were just drunk and had the wrong apartment number. But that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a copy of my exact key, or some kind of lock-picking device. I've never copied my key or given it to anyone. Here's the other thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, but as I figured out later, that apartment number doesn't exist anywhere on the complex. Standing back from the door, I took a long broom handle and jabbed it hard into the face of the door, letting them know I was on the other side. They immediately stopped fiddling with the lock and took off running. I debated whether to call 911 and decided against it, unless they returned. I know they'll be long gone by the time anyone gets there, and it would be too risky to follow them to try and get a better description or license plate, and I don't have enough identifying info as to make an arrest. I found a police report the next day and let the apartment management know. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and ask for police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that's not a surprise to me. It's been seven months since this happened, and no further incidents. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening. I don't think they'll be back, but one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt, so I can leave that deadbolt always locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that the deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens, but I can honestly say I'm proud of how I stayed calm, and I was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, though, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. And close to ten years ago, my best mate and I scored the deal of the century. Liv and her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as chips rent, so the property wasn't considered unoccupied. Their insurance would still cover it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving up a bit closer to town in a year's time. But when they spotted this place, it was just perfect, so they had to snap it up. They couldn't be bothered, though, dealing with rando tenants for a year, so we were offered it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian-style house, with a hallway running through the majority of the length on the left side. Three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off that hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open-plan living room, and a kitchen and a backyard. It was in an inner Melbourneian suburb, and was totally fenced in with six-foot fence on three sides. The front had this cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged besides the bathroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard, and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important later. My mate obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with some lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with a window facing the gravel path and fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to ten months in bliss. A great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was pretty stellar. One hot summer's night, we said our good nights to each other, and I hit the hay and zonked out pretty immediately. My housemate decided to stay up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that for just over an hour, before she heard a weird scratching on the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch, till she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like eternity, until she heard the noise again, and again. Slowly looking up, she saw a man wearing a hoodie trying to force open her window, looking her dead in the eyes. 
She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up in a daze as she was pulling my hand and whisper yelling, you know the one, that somebody was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overly dramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunching of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunching continued, getting closer and closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet, but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just in time for him to reach the window. He looked in at me, but didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was thoroughly shitting myself now, and my housemate was sobbing on the floor looking up at me like a bunny about to be torn apart by a fox. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked, and ran to my room and called the cops. I don't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive only three minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn straight into the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later. The police identified themselves. Turns out the man had vaulted over the back fence, quite an impressive feat, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, then asked if they could come in and take a look around. The cops were honestly amazing. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe. I was really impressed with how they handled the situation. I offered them a cuppa, which they politely declined, as they took our statements. They asked if there was anyone we could stay with tonight. My housemate and I stayed at her boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in the house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated, and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the man was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at a train station just two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know. But all I can think is that we were so fucking lucky that it went the way it did. This is a story from my childhood. One of the ones that haunt me to this day. Have you ever seen one of those memes where it says people react like a criminal whenever an unexpected visitor arrives on their doorstep? They freeze and drop everything they're doing, throw themselves to the floor to avoid being seen in a window. This is my story of how I became one of those people. At the time, I must have been around maybe seven and a half years old. I was visiting the Midwest, Kansas to be exact, from South Korea, where I was born and raised. I was just visiting family, nothing major. On that particular night, the adults, our aunt and uncle and our parents, were going out to have a date night. So our parents had ordered us some pizza before they left and waited for it to arrive, so we wouldn't have to open the door for anyone. My aunt and uncle had two kids, two boys to be exact, and they were both ages 15 and 8. Like I said before, I was maybe seven and a half at the time. My older sister was 11, and our baby brother was the tender age of three. So all in all, we were ready to just have a night of fun games. After all, it wasn't often the cousins got together like this. They lived in the States, and we lived off in Korea and we loved each other very dearly. We saw our parents out at the garage entryway. They made sure we knew the rules and we could recite them back to them. They also made sure we knew where the telephones were and the emergency numbers to accompany them. It's just going to be a typical night of no parents. 
or so we thought. It had been an hour, maybe two after our parents had left. We were downstairs in the basement in the playroom, or the game room, whatever people like to call it these days. We were down there just watching movies, playing air hockey and things of that nature. We were all just being kids. We weren't being loud or anything like that, and even if we were, it wouldn't be too big of a deal, because the way houses were in Kansas, the basements are built into the ground in case of a tornado. I had gone upstairs with my oldest cousin because I wanted to grab a drink of chocolate milk and I couldn't reach the cups alone. We wandered upstairs into the kitchen, which was on the far end of the house. The others stayed downstairs and continued playing their games. We had been upstairs for maybe 15 to 20 minutes because while I was drinking my milk, my older cousin was making some snacks since we were all planning to watch movies together. All of a sudden, we hear the doorbell ring. I remember my cousin looking at me and telling me to stay there, because it was odd that the doorbell was ringing. It wasn't late, but it certainly wasn't early. I say this because it was summer, and it was around 8 o'clock. My cousin started to creep towards the door quietly. It was unnerving for someone to be ringing the doorbell at night. We weren't expecting any guests, and the pizza had already been delivered before our parents had even left. Before he's even halfway to the door, whoever's on the other side starts rapidly ringing the doorbell over and over, the constant ringing echoing throughout the house. By this point, I had looked over toward the staircase, and I saw our other siblings starting to creep up the stairs, with the exclusion of the baby, who was still asleep in the crib down in the guest room. The oldest of the kids, let's go ahead and call him James from here on out, put his finger to his lips and told us to be quiet and make it seem like no one was home, despite there being lights on. He crept closer to the door as the banging and ringing on the doorbell continued, and he peeked out through the peephole. I had never seen my cousin look so freaked out. His face drained of color, and he backed away from the door rapidly. He told us all to go downstairs, but of course we didn't listen. Honestly, we all thought he was playing a joke. Maybe it was some of his friends wanting to scare us, since he had canceled plans that night to stay home and watch all of us kids. My older sister shoved her way past him and decided to look through the peephole herself. For whatever reason, whatever was on the other side of the door made her have the exact same reaction and she stumbled away from the door just as pale. At the time, I didn't understand what was going on. I don't think any of us younger kids really did, but something wasn't right. After a while, about 20 minutes, whoever was at the door stopped ringing the doorbell, and all was quiet again. It seemed like they gave up, and maybe they just thought no one was home. If only we knew how wrong we all were. We all sat in silence for a while after this initially occurred. My other cousin, who I'm just going to call Kyle for the purpose of this story, mustered up the courage to ask his brother James who was at the door why James and my sister were acting so skittish. James told us that there had been a man wearing dark clothes who seemed to be carrying some kind of package or a large box. He couldn't make out his face. Of course, Kyle, being the little smarty pants he was, started to mock James, saying how he was just being a scaredy cat and didn't recognize their neighbors. Kyle was convinced it was just a neighbor trying to drop off a package that might have gotten mixed up in the mail, seeing as that sort of thing happened all the time. We all agreed that was the probable cause, until we realized that whoever was ringing the doorbell didn't leave the package on the porch. Which, isn't that what most neighbors would do? In the case no one answered, they'd just leave it, right? And why would they bring it over to the house in the dead of night, instead of just waiting for the next day? We all thought it was over and done with, so we pushed it to the back of our minds. We didn't think it was important to call our parents and let them know what had happened. For us, it was over, after all. We went back to the kitchen and grabbed the snacks, and started to head back downstairs. 
until we heard banging again. But it wasn't from the front porch this time. We were in shock. We froze in fear. I mean, it was coming from right behind us. We turned slowly and looked back in the direction from which we came from. We were currently standing in the dining room, as we had already passed through the kitchen. It was like someone was banging on the kitchen window. You know, the one that's typically above the sink, so your mother and father can watch the kids while they play in the backyard. James and my older sister, who I'm just going to call Nicole, got down on their hands and knees, and they crawled back into the kitchen, much against our charging. Just as quickly as they crawled into the kitchen to take a peek, they crawled back to us, almost in hyper speed. They told us to all stay down and stay as low as we could, as we crawled into the den further down the hallway. James had us all huddle close to the fireplace, out of sight from all the windows. He told us to stay there. He was taking charge. He was going to protect his home and his family the best he knew how. James quickly crawled away. I didn't know where he was going, but I was scared, and the banging was getting louder. It was getting closer and closer. At some point, I started to cry, and I remember Kyle put his hand over my mouth. My sister was hugging us both tight. Around that time, we saw James starting to appear back from around the corner. He had grabbed his baseball bat. He had crawled up another staircase to get to his room. He crawled past us and put a finger on his lips again, and that's when we realized he was crawling towards the doggy door. He was attempting to close off one of the entrances to the house that wasn't locked yet. Thankfully, he managed to get it latched in time, because we don't think the man outside had realized that the house had a doggy door. And when he heard the lock click in place, the banging became more erratic, more violent. All of a sudden, much like before, the banging stopped, but we could all hear pacing. Someone was walking back and forth across the porch, slowly and deliberately. His heavy boots thundered across the red oak porch, and then without a warning, the pacing stopped. It became quiet, eerily quiet. Then the man called out, Won't you open the door? I have a package for you. We didn't respond. We stayed quiet, or as quiet as we could with the way our hearts were pounding and how ragged our breathing was. The stranger called out again. Open the door. Again, we didn't answer. Then he called out angrily. I said, open the door. I have a package. Like before, we didn't answer. We all just stayed still. The man began to bang again this time directly on the panel window of the room we were sitting in, yelling, I know you're in there. I know you can hear me. Open the door or I'll open it for you. The windows rattled and shook violently with each impact from the strange man. Thankfully, our cousin's house had reinforced windows, so they weren't easy to break. Unluckily, we didn't have any neighbors close by, so nobody would hear the commotion. But while he was making all this noise, we took the opportunity to book it to another room and grab a phone. At one point, while we were on the phone with the police officers, they asked us if we could describe the man. All we knew was that he was tall and wearing all black, so Kyle and I decided to be brave. If something did happen to us that night, at least they would have a better description of who had done it. We crawled back into the den and we dared to look out of a small corner of the window. We gently moved the curtains out of the way, and Lord behold, the man was still banging. He had moved the shutters off outside the window. They were hanging off their hinges at this point, rattling in the wind. We both made eye contact with the deranged man, direct, soul-searching eye contact. I don't think before this night I had ever believed but there's pure evil in the world. When I looked into that man's eyes, I swear I didn't see a soul. I know it sounds crazy, but those were not the eyes of a man. He was something unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Animalistic may be the only word I could use to describe it besides demonic. 
It was unnatural, and something I never want to see again. When he saw us, his smile twisted into a grin that I'm sure he thought was reassuring. He crouched down so he could get a better look at us, I assume. And then he said, Don't you want your mail? You have mail. I can give it to you. But only if you open the door. I remember just grabbing on Kyle's hand for dear life. Kyle shook his head no and threw the curtains back over the window. Before we even had a chance to move any further, the man started violently banging on the window again. At this point, James had had enough. He passed the phone over to my sister and yelled, Leave us alone. The police are on their way, and you're not getting in here. After that, it seemed like the man had panicked. The banging abruptly stopped, and we heard rapid footsteps on the porch. Kyle and I peeked out the window again. The man was running through the yard, past all the trees, and he jumped the fence. The wooden 22-foot fence at the end of the yard into the alley that separated the neighborhood from the old cemetery. We stayed on the phone with police until they arrived. Our parents arrived not long after, but the man was never caught. We don't know what happened after that night. He just disappeared into thin air. So this happened to me on Thursday, April 25th, and I can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I happened to glance out my window to see a man in his mid-thirties wearing a baseball cap and roaming around on my property, his hands on his hips, and walking with a weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff, and it looks over onto our five-acre property down below. I live in the PNW, so it's a pretty scenic view. I was pretty confused and thought maybe it had been a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house, just admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point, because the dude walked to the side of my house out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming at my front yard and driveway, looking at things and checking out my house. He still hadn't seen me at this point. I called my dad and asked him if we had hired anyone to come by the house. He said not that he knew of, and told me he was going to call my mom and ask her, then call me back. I'm waiting for the call to arrive, when I notice this strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to my front door. The dude still hasn't seen me and he's wandering around, so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system. I armed it, so if he did try to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then, I get a call back from my dad, saying neither him nor my mom had hired anyone to come by today and that I needed to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs, and called my city's police station. I explained to a woman on the other end what was happening, and she decided she wasn't going to send an officer out. Instead, she gave me a number to call their emergency dispatch line, and told me to talk to them. I called the number she gave me, and immediately I get an automated message saying, Thank you for calling, my town's name, non-emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated, because 15 minutes have passed, and this weird man is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone. Apparently, that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, 
I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading toward my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place, even though I was a younger girl home alone with a strange man lurking outside. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her, when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted police to come to where I was. She agreed, and I went back upstairs to check on the weird man. He was now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loudly, or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent and loud male voice coming from within his car. Then all of a sudden, I heard the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you, and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked it up right away. Instead, I was greeted by heavy, creepy breathing. I'm not sure whose it was, but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the cops were already on their way. And Twenty minutes had passed at this point. The man was still lurking in my driveway in his car, and the cops weren't. And keep in mind, I live in a smaller town, so there's no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. And finally, this dude is leaving my driveway, right as the cops pull in. They stop him and ask a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy-looking flyer, saying, It was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired, until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and told her the cops had said it was just a landscaper she had hired, and that he said he'd made an appointment. My mom replied with, I can assure you, we never hired a landscaper, and we don't even need one. I was around eight or nine when this happened. I went to visit my grandparents on the other side of town. They lived five minutes away from an elementary school, and I would often walk to it to play on the playground. A young family with a daughter my age lived right next door, and we would play together whenever I came over. Well, one day we decided to take a walk after having some fun at the park. We still had a lot of energy, and dinner wasn't quite ready yet, so we wandered throughout the neighborhood. We were laughing and picking flowers along the way, when I noticed a white van. We continued our walk, and before you know it, I had completely forgotten all about it. My friend had stopped to tie her shoe, and I was looking around for more flowers to pick, when I realized that we had gone a lot further than we ever had before. I didn't recognize the houses in front of me, and it was going to get dark very soon. As soon as that thought entered my mind... I see the white van rounding the corner, heading straight towards us. My stomach sank. It was the same van from earlier, but something seemed different. They stopped in the middle of the road and stared at us. I told my friend that we needed to go, and I asked her if she recognized the houses around us or the van in front of us. Of course, she didn't for either. I tell her that we should probably head home, and she agrees. The van then drives past us slowly, and the man in the passenger seat rolls down the window. Uh, excuse me, do you girls know where, uh, Apple Street is? We both say no, and I get a good look at the van. It has a picture of a vacuum on the side, and a company name I can't remember. He tells us that they're cleaning houses in the neighborhood, and they can't seem to find the street they're looking for. I know I'm not supposed to talk to strangers, so I grab my friend's hand and tell the men sorry, but no, we don't, and we keep walking. We begin our walk home, but my uneasy feeling goes stronger every step of the way. We were going back the same way we'd came, when I started to recognize the houses. 
We were only about ten minutes away at this point. Then I hear it, the van coming down the street behind us. I told my friend to grab a rock from the path, because now I was sure they were following us. I was scared, but I knew we were not too far from my grandparents' house, and we could get there faster if we ran. So that's what we do. Picture two terrified eight-year-old girls running down the street with softball-sized rocks in their hands. I look back and see the van racing after us. I can hear someone yelling. It's the man driving, and I hear the word directions. I stop because I'm out of breath, and I think maybe that's all they wanted. Maybe I was just overreacting. Boy, was I wrong. As soon as I stop, my friend does too, and so does the van. I get a good look at the driver this time, and he's explaining that all they wanted was directions. But I knew that something was wrong, and before I could even get any words out, the sliding door blew open, and a man in the back started rushing towards us. We pelted the rocks at him, and ran as fast as we could to my grandparents' house. When we got inside, we started crying our eyes out. My mom had apparently arrived while we were gone. I run to her and my grandma, and told them what just happened. She runs outside yelling to my grandma to call the cops while she looks for the van. She sees it parked two houses down, and she charges it like a bull. I had run out after her, so I'm standing there screaming. My mom is tiny, but she is fierce, and was in mama bear mode. The van started to pull away, but I'll never forget what happened next. She jumped onto the hood of the van and started beating in their window. They stop and she yells that she's making a citizen's arrest and they need to stop the car now. They act like they're going to. They slowly pull over and park, but as soon as she gets off the hood, they race off. Thank God she managed to remember their entire license plate. When the police get there, they ask us so many questions. I try to explain everything that happened from the moment I first saw the van. They run the license plate number, and it comes back as out of state. They say I can go now, and they want to speak to my mom alone. When she comes back inside, I hear her talking to my grandma in the kitchen. What she said makes my blood run cold to this day. The man who owned the car was linked to a kidnapping out of state and had a bolo out for his arrest. The police ended up arresting all three men, and we had to go in to give an official statement. My friend, my mom, and I picked all three of them out of the lineup, and they were charged with kidnapping out of state, and our attempted kidnapping. I never went walking in my grandparents' neighborhood after that, and I still cringe when I see a white van. That's when I realized there's a reason for all those creepy white van stories after all. In the fall of 2015, I began college in a very small town in the middle of nowhere. Its population as of 2019 is 55,489. This town was right in the middle of the Midwestern state I lived in, in the middle of the Great Plains. The town was pretty much only existent because of the college. It was a state college, which has about 20,000 students a year. As you could imagine, the college brought in a plethora of faculty, business, and really put the town on the map. I personally stuck out like a sore thumb. You see, even though I lived in the Bible Belt, I had been Wiccan since I was 15. I never identified with Jesus and God when I grew old enough to dissect the Christian faith. A big aspect about my personality is that I am very accepting. I mention this because it, ultimately, led to some chaos later on. I'm the class clown mom friend type. I'm sure you know the type. Goofy and caring, pretty much ride or die. So, I was in the middle of nowhere at the beginning of my college career, and I was surrounded by strangers who were just as nervous and awkward as I was. Due to being in the middle of the Bible Belt, my friends really loved my tarot card, medium, future-seeing persona. And quickly, whilst making new friends, I ran into a few folks who wanted to learn how to read tarot. We lived in the same dorm community. They were nice, and I loved teaching. 
So that's how I ended up getting into cahoots with Alex, Davis, April, Sam, Rosie, Katie, and Sky. They were friends from the year prior, so I was sort of folded into the friend group as the newest, shiniest object. After mentioning that I read tarot, the group was over the moon. One afternoon, in the basement of our dormitory, I had a tarot reading session for the group. It was a lazy fall day, mid-November, surrounded by soda cans, Kit Kats, and our leftover schoolwork. I began to read each and every group member's cards. With reading, you start to peek into a person's soul. Each card gives you a sliver of personhood. I quite regularly have to console people for the truth that lies within the reading. I've often had to play the role of therapist after the cards read people for filth. So it was unsurprising to me when the group sat in shock and curiosity, goosebumps prickling their arms. It was a normal response. Hours flew by, I did general readings, question-based readings, love-life readings, you name it. As time rolled on, more of my talent slipped out. Soon, I was reading palms, giving psychic advice, talking about my Wiccan journey. I believed that what you take from the earth, you should give back. It's inherent to my belief system to do everything with love, to never mean any ill will. Alex asked me if I could teach them about my beliefs then Katie, then Davis. Before I knew it, everyone in the group had asked for an impromptu teaching. Don't get this wrong, I loved teaching, but more so I craved this positive attention. My childhood was quite awful, and I was very abused. I just wanted people who cared about me. These people were some of the first to really seem to care, who were really interested in what I had to say. So with rose-colored glasses, I began a fun little info sesh with my brand new friends. I didn't see the warning signs. What started out as little meetings in the study rooms turned into hour-long lectures where the group hung to every word I said. As we got closer, more of my horrific past was uncovered. I shared tales of my trauma, of all the times I should have died, the beatings, how my own mom had tried to murder me. I thought I had found my tribe. I was really excited and pleased to be around folks. I didn't start to see the warning signs until it was too late. Things went smoothly for a while. A routine of teaching the group, hanging out, having dinner, talking about normal things, like school and what was going on in the dorm communities. I really liked it, actually. One of the group members, Davis, was transitioning female to male, and he struggled a lot with his identity. He was raised in a pretty strict household, so his transition wasn't exactly taken very well by his family. He also struggled with BPD, which made people in the group very uncomfortable. I think mostly because they didn't understand it. Keep in mind, mental health at the time wasn't really something people were open about, as it was right in the middle of the Bible Belt. So Davis would occasionally act erratic, start fights, get worked up, cry randomly, I'm sure part of this was due to transitioning. I can't imagine how emotional and hard it would be to go through that. What really set things off, though, was when Davis started doubting if he should fully transition or not. Davis had already been on testosterone for quite some time, was male-presenting, but didn't have top surgery yet. One day, right before spring break, Davis had worn a dress, makeup, and heels around campus. At the time, I thought it was kind of strange but I figured it was Davis's life, so it didn't really matter to me. The rest of the group, however, started to obsess over this. It was very out of character, but the group thought there was more to it. When Davis left for class, adorned in his dress and heels, Alex began to speculate. There was a long, weird history between Alex, Davis, and Skye, one where Davis was sort of relationship-like flirting with both Alex and Skye, creating some animosity. Alex and Skye were best friends, but Davis had sort of wriggled his way into both of their hearts. Alex wasn't one to really discuss their feelings, so they pretended this love triangle didn't affect them, but Alex had become bitter. After Davis walked out, Skye in tow, Alex began their speculation. What's wrong with him? Why is he acting like that? It's like I hardly know him. Katie, one for gossip, joined right in. Honestly, it's like Davis is a completely different person. I don't know who this is, but I hate him. He's taking advantage of Skye. 
the rest of the conversation began to snowball. It was a frustrating situation for those who had been in the friend group for a long time. I was pretty much indifferent. I didn't exactly know what was going on. And honestly, I thought they were kind of making a fuss out of nothing. If you're uncomfortable with what's happening, then just talk it out. I digress. I had been working on a term paper, not really minding too much about the conversation, until suddenly April asked me, Hey, do you think you could be messing around with some bad magic? I shrugged. Davis had asked about love spells and other things that I don't really mess with. He was really into the idea that he could just put a spell on someone and make them fall in love with him. I had told him that taking away free will is something you should never mess with. The universe doesn't take kindly to those who harm, obstruct, or take free will away from someone. April had been there when Davis asked. When Alex looked questioningly at her, April spilled the beans. Something in Alex's face contorted, as if you could see their heartbreak turn into pure rage. Alex excused themselves, and that was that. I remember being a little distressed about the situation. I really hated conflict back then. I was spending spring break at Rosie's house. Her and Sam lived in the same town. Alex and Katie would be there too. When I agreed to spend the break with them, it was before drama had started, but by the time we got to spring break, it was already too late to change anything. I spent the whole break listening to this conspiracy grow, and the four of them had begun to elaborate on this black magic idea. Rosie brought up the thought that maybe Davis was possessed, and I told them that I didn't think this was likely. I had a feeling things were about to go awry. The mood just felt weird. I had never been in the presence of a group of people who just accused another of being possessed. When I shot down this idea, they mentioned the time Davis growled the week prior. We were playing a game online when Davis growled a response, and I had jokingly said he sounded like a demon. I still told them it was nothing, but they would not let up. Realizing I was in a bit of trouble, I came up with a quick solution. I told them we could do some protection spells so if anything would go awry, it would be okay. That seemed to appease them well enough, or it's so I thought. Luckily, they left the topic alone until we were heading back to campus. We need to do an exorcism on Davis, Rosie said, a wild look in her eyes. Rosie had dabbled in paganism before she'd met me, so she already had a solid set of beliefs and theories. The issue here, however was that Rosie and Sam thought they could use their paganism as a tool to control those around them. I tried to correct this thought process, as it was against my belief system, which they seemed to be receptive to, at least until they felt threatened. Davis had sent a text message to Rosie about some drama with Alex and Skye, sending Rosie into a downward spiral. Before I knew it, the narrative had suddenly shifted into Davis is possessed by the demon Lilith. I didn't know what to do. I told them he wasn't. It just didn't make sense. But I was too late. I didn't know. I figured that if I got back to campus, took some time away from them, everyone would have calmed down. So that's exactly what I did. I tried to do as much damage control as I could on the rest of the ride. But then when I got back to the dorm, I locked myself away. When asked, I just said I was behind on work from spring break. Things were relatively quiet, and I felt safe. I figured it was temporary insanity or something. I was sat downstairs talking to April a few days after I had locked myself away. We were just chit-chatting about what she had done over the break, when I saw Rosie and Katie suddenly rush past the sitting room. They were frantic. They waved at us when they ran past but didn't say anything. A bit later, Skye ran in the same direction, crying. When he saw us, he rushed in. Davis said he's a demon and needed to be exorcised. I jumped to my feet and started running towards his dorm room. Sam and Alex stood in the hallway. Their faces hardened when they saw me, Skye and April walking up. You're not allowed in there. Davis is a danger to you, Sam said. He admitted he was possessed. He's not possessed. Just let me in there. We bickered for a long time until I said that if they were going to do an exorcism, they needed me in there. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. Davis was laid on the bed, tied down to the bed frame. He was crying. Rosie and Katie were inside, setting things down around the bed. 
Rosie held a tattered old book in her hand, and there was sage burning on a plate. Katie yelled something, but I couldn't focus. I just kept thinking all of a sudden that these people were fucking crazy. All I could see was Davis, crying their eyes out on the bed. I'm sorry. I didn't know I was possessed. I didn't know I was going to hurt you. Davis wailed, shaking. Shh. We're going to get the demon out. You're going to be okay. I kept saying that he wasn't possessed, but nobody would listen to me. And that's when I saw the knife. It was bronze in color, with something dark crusted on it. It sat in a bowl from the dining hall, in a mix of what looked like salt, and also blood. In shock, I looked over to Rosie, spotting a bloody gauze on her arm. It was like my world stopped. At this point, I had realized that these people were fucking crazy. I had seen enough scary movies that I could only imagine what was going to happen. I grabbed the knife and cut through the cloth that tied Davis down, grabbed his wrist and bolted from the room. I called Davis's mom and told her to come get him. We went to my dorm until she got there, with me trying to talk some sense into him. Davis went home shortly after. Rosie, Katie, Sam, and Alex were blowing up my phone. April had come with me when I ran out with Davis. When he had gone home, she started to talk about how I needed to be careful, because if Hillary Clinton were elected president, I was special. My mother had told me that she had to kill me, or else the government would get to me, that I was special. April knew this. Apparently, she believed it, too. I just nodded, telling her I needed some sleep. After she left, I immediately started filing paperwork to transfer schools. I moved two hours away, blocking everyone in the group's phone numbers. I couldn't believe everything that had happened, but looking back, I started to see that the signs were there all along. They would always say things like, You're a witchy Jesus, and had blind faith in everything I said. The most memorable moment was when I told them that the sky was actually green. I was just joking around being a sarcastic asshole, but April and Alex just nodded. When I said I was joking, April defended them, saying, well, technically the sky just reflects the earth, so it really is green. Hindsight is 2020. I accidentally started a cult, creating a small hellhole where everyone blindly believed everything I said and thought I was a modern-day Jesus. So, to my former cult members, let's never meet again. And also, please, get some help. This all happened a long time ago, in 1994. I was only eight years old, and my worldview was as narrow as you'd expect any child's to be. Uh, aside from this memory I'm about to share, that year was marked by a nail-biting series of penalty kicks that ended in a nervous Roberto Baggio, aka the savior of Italy, kicking the final shot over and above the net in a crushing defeat to Italy and his own career. For the remainder of the year, I was glued to my Game Boy, playing World Cup USA 94 and trying to recreate the game with a better ending for Baggio. Of course, the graphics were bleeding edge at the time. We had just moved from my childhood home in a bad part of town to a new home in suburbia. My dad's small business had finally started making money after three years of losing it, and my parents wanted to give us kids some space to stretch out and play. At the time, I only had an older sister, who was 11. I was convinced this new house was haunted, but kind of thought it was a bit cool, actually. My house sat on three acres of land, bordered by woods, and was pretty far tucked back from the rest of the neighborhood. My parents wanted to double the house in size, and had a nice kitchen for my mom who enjoys cooking for guests. They went through the motions of getting the addition permitted, and tried to find a contractor, but didn't like anyone they met. Then, an employee of my father recommended her brother, Steve, who was a young contractor, early 30s. He'd just gotten his license and was very hungry for work. It was summertime, and my sister and I didn't have school, so my parents would leave her to watch me while they were at work. Twice a week, my grandma came to pick up my sister for dance lessons. I would only be alone for 90 minutes or so, and I was good about keeping myself occupied, so nobody ever thought it was a problem. 
On the days that we were together, Steve began to work on the house, and aside from the occasional hello, he would come and work a little at a time. It started off well, with a solid few weeks of work, but then he started coming less and less. The times he did show up, he'd spend 10% of the time working, and the rest of the time slipped between dancing around with headphones in and jumping on my trampoline. Yeah, he danced a lot. I didn't really understand why an adult was dancing so much while he was supposed to be working, but that also didn't really bother me, since my sister was a dancer. But my trampoline, that thing was my pride and joy. I had to vacuum the house and rake leaves for months to save up the $240 to be able to afford that thing, and there he was wearing his heavy steel-toed boots while he jumped about haphazardly. I wasn't the type to start a conflict, so I begrudgingly let it slide. One day, though, after he spent a larger-than-average jumping session on it, I went outside to inspect and found a massive tear along the edge of the trampoline. That was that. Little high-up Sam had had enough of Steve's boots. I finally complained to my parents that he ripped my trampoline, and then it all came out. He only came for a few hours a couple of times a week, and mostly just hung out and danced and played on the trampoline while my sister and I sat in the back room. I didn't fully understand what this all meant, but I remember my parents calling him to yell at him. As they yelled, I felt a big wave of guilt wash over me. I knew it was hard work, and my favorite thing about the trampoline was that it was big enough for everyone to share it. I didn't want to be a jerk, so the next time he came over, I approached him and tried to apologize. I had practiced what I was going to say. I was going to tell him I was sorry that I told on him, but I'd worked hard to buy that trampoline with my own money. He could still use it, but only if he would take off his boots before jumping on it. As I approached him, though, he threw his hammer to the ground, pointed at me, and started screaming loudly. I don't remember what he said. I was so shocked and definitely didn't expect that reaction, so I ran away, and my sister, who had heard the yelling and saw me running back, called my parents. Later that night, my parents let us know that they'd fired Steve, and he wouldn't be coming back anymore. They were on the search for a new contractor to replace him. That week, my sister and I would hear a car pulling up, idling a bit, then pulling away. We looked out every time, and it was Steve's red truck. It didn't seem strange for some reason. Maybe he was finalizing some plans to hand over the job to the next guy. A child's mind is something else. One day, my grandma came to pick up my sister for dance, and minutes after they'd pulled away, I had my nose buried in World Cup USA 94. It was 30 seconds into my latest Italy vs. Brazil match when I heard the rhythmic crunching of leaves outside my window. They stopped suddenly. Remember, I thought my house was haunted, so in my mind it was a ghost or a skeleton or some possessed doll. I freaked out and lay frozen in my bed. Then I heard sounds on the window frame, like something clawing to get a grip on the handle and trying to open them. The crunching footsteps started again and moved to my other window, followed by the same scratching sounds. At this point, I put the Game Boy down and ran out of my room and into the living room, which connects to the foyer. As I was running, I saw a figure move across the front windows and knew it was Steve. Whew, not a possessed doll after all. He smiled at me and tapped gently on the glass. Hey Sam, can you and I just talk? I feel really bad about what I did. I stared at him for a second, not quite sure what to do, before I started to feel uneasy. Come on, just let me in for a second. I want to make this right. Something felt off. His eyes seemed off. His smile seemed off. So I replied, I'm not allowed to let you in. Sorry. Just like that. A switch flipped in his head, and he started pounding the window angrily. Don't play games. You better let me in right now. His face turned red. His eyes went wide. It almost seemed like he was drooling. Confused, I turned and ran back into my room and locked the door. Hey, if you don't open the door, I'm going to break this window. I know you're in there. I screamed that I was calling the police and telling them that he was there. A bluff. Everyone had a cordless phone in their room except for me, but I didn't know what else to do. 
Just like that, I heard him pound on the glass one last time before hearing his truck drive out of the driveway. Shaken, I left my room and called my mom. A few days later, she told me he would no longer be bothering me. I thought she had done her mom thing and given him a stern talking to. My mom was terrifying, a short Italian woman who spit fireballs and wasn't afraid to hit you with a wooden spoon, so that seemed the obvious conclusion. When I was 19 and home from college one night, I asked my parents whatever happened with them. They told me that according to his sister, their employee, he had fallen down a drug spiral, likely meth, and lost control. A few days after the incident at our house, he had been accused of assaulting another young boy, and the police found incriminating photos. After that, he jumped off a local bridge and ended his own life before he could be arrested. That's when it all hit me. My memory as a child was horribly skewed. He was not just trying to talk to me, and wasn't mad at me for not letting him in. Looking back as an adult, it was clear Steve had some issues he was working through. Being gay in the 90s must not have been easy, and it makes me sad to think about what kind of person he might have been if society had just accepted him. But what he did to the other boy is absolutely unacceptable, and there's no way that can be justified, no matter how he might have tried to. It might have been me that day. I was lucky to have dodged him. When I was seven, I lived in a dusty, vacant part of the West, with an atmosphere straight out of a Judy Bloom novel. Despite everyone on my neighborhood living on large, isolated plots of land, mostly being ranching families, kids played hockey in the streets, crime was minimal to non-existent, and everybody knew everyone else. I had a very tight-knit group of friends. Names changed to protect privacy. Let's call them Shirley, Natalie, and Bailey. We'd all been friends since before we could even walk, mostly because we were the same age and all lived in the same neighborhood. We weren't exactly idiots, but we were definitely sheltered. The same could be said of our parents, many of whom had ended their education after high school, or even a bit sooner, and grew up in a similar, if not the exact same, community, where anyone who'd shake your hand was probably trustworthy. That's why no one noticed anything before it was too late. And just before the summer started, a new family moved in. Families moving in wasn't terribly uncommon, but this family had a girl my and my friend's age, so it became a very big deal. Her name was Ella, and her whole family was a bit strange. It took two weeks for them to introduce themselves to anyone, Plenty of people went over to introduce themselves, but even when it was obvious people were home, no one came to the door. Finally, word got around that the father was a minister at some church no one in town had heard of, and the wife was working part-time at the Taylors. We spent a lot of time outside and eventually spotted Ella. My friends and I invited her to join our group in whatever we were up to that afternoon. Through that, we learned she had four older brothers and an infant sister. She and her whole family had very antiquated gender roles, prayed before and about virtually anything they did, and would casually mention the end of the world as a non-sequitur. Despite this, they managed to establish themselves as pillars of the community. The father, let's call him Mr. Cyrus, came to every town hall, and his wife, Miss Cyrus, took up a leadership role in the PTA. I think their wholesome Christian image helped defray what would have otherwise been deeply troubling outbursts of rage, which Mr. Cyrus would exhibit, sometimes right out in public. He'd hear another adult use a phrase like, God damn it, and fly into a frenzy about how dare you forsake our Lord and Savior, taking his name in vain. His wife would make unsolicited, judgmental comments about how other people raise their kids, especially daughters. And despite all that, within a few months, you'd never know they hadn't lived there all their lives. The unspoken understanding in this town was that if you left your kids in someone else's care, they had free reign to do whatever they thought best for them and to feed them, instruct them, or discipline them, as if they were your own. The first time I went to Ella's, nothing out of the ordinary happened. 
The second time, Mr. Cyrus led all of us in prayer before we ate our snack, and afterwards. I mentioned to my mom how I found it irritating, and she basically said, their house, their rules. I shrugged it off. Neither of us had any way to know Mr. Cyrus was just testing the waters. A few weeks later, several of our families had gotten together, and Mr. Cyrus brought a rifle out of nowhere and asked us girls if we wanted to shoot some cans. He said to the parents when she'd gotten us excited, I mean, if you're comfortable with guns. Remember, this is rural America. Not one of us girls hadn't already fired a gun in our lives, and if any of the parents were uncomfortable about guns, they would never admit so in public. Things progressed little by little every time I went over. Within the next few visits, my friends and I were made to participate in a mini Bible study lesson. I guess one of the other girls had told their parents about the praying, because when we were dropped off, Mr. Cyrus said, Oh, I forgot to mention, Eileen and I had a family Bible study planned for tonight. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can bring the girls back another night. This was the West in the 80s. Christianity was the default, and even people who didn't really practice felt obligated to pretend they did. No one in this town would have objected to their kids participating in a Bible study loud enough for anyone to hear. It didn't even matter, because the Bible study was also sort of fun. None of us complained about it, and we'd all seen how into it Ella seemed, and wouldn't have wanted to hurt her feelings by complaining. I think Mr. Cyrus took that as one of the final go-aheads needed. In late August, Mrs. Cyrus called my and my friend's parents and asked if we wanted to have a sleepover with Ella. Everyone agreed. The first red flag flew up right away. Most of us girls spent half our days off from school doing farm chores and helping around the house, so we were all in jeans. I had never seen Ella in pants ever, but what we wore had never been any sort of problem. When we got there this time, though, Ella had laid out four of her dresses on the bed and told us to change into them to look more like girls. We all liked playing dress-up, so we changed without complaint. But when we went downstairs, Mr. Cyrus said, Look how ladylike you all are. Doesn't that feel better? You've made God very happy. At this point in a play date, we usually go out back and made mud pies or play tag or something. But instead, Mr. Cyrus jumped right into a Bible lesson. He was basically giving a sermon and talked about heaven and hell on the ways to get into heaven and be sent to hell. He scared our seven-year-old minds half to death about the fires of hell. And then he did what I can only describe as a cartoony attempt at hypnosis. And this was years ago, so it's a little fuzzy, but he dangled some piece of jewelry, like a necklace or something, right in front of us and swung it back and forth. While he did that, he recited Bible verses about telling the truth and repentance and the end times, clean souls entering the glory of heaven. And then he sat us all down on a couch. We were all thoroughly freaked out at this point by the heaven-hell talk, but figured everything else was just a religious ritual of their home, because he'd so carefully desensitized us over the past few months. He talked about sin and repentance, and asked us if we wanted to go to heaven or hell. I think you can guess which we said. He said the only way to get to heaven was to be baptized. One of my friends, Shirley, said she'd already been baptized, but Mr. Cyrus cut them off. Baptized into the real faith. God's faith. He asked if we wanted to know how we could become baptized, and we said yes. He said by confessing our sins and making them right with God, committing to living in a Christian-like way, and most importantly, accepting Jesus as our Savior. Sounded easy enough for us. For the next I don't know how long, there were no clocks in this house and it was after dark by then, we basically did a very intense Bible study. It could have been anywhere between 10 minutes and 4 hours when you're little and are not accustomed to going to church. Any amount of Bible study feels like an eternity. This was interspersed with different prayers for salvation and making promises about rejecting sin and resisting temptation. We were all getting very tired and feeling our patience wearing thin for tolerating others' religious beliefs. Then there was a whole barrage of prepper things. Different types of guns, talk about growing your own food, the importance of self-reliance, basically a lecture on survival skills, but with constant emphasis that the greatest survival skill is being a good Christian. 
He kept us up most of the night after that, praying and such. He did some ritual with rubbing oil on our foreheads as well. He vaguely talked on and off throughout the night about whether we'd want to go with Ella to a wonderful place with lots of other kids who love Christ. He said he'd ask our parents about taking us there on a weekend trip. I knew when I was agreeing with him that I had no interest, but my mom had taught me the polite thing to do when you get an invitation to something you have no intention of going to is to smile and express interest, then closer to the date say something came up. So I just smiled and expressed interest. He didn't feed us anything the entire time we were there. By the time it started to get light out, we were baptized in the backyard. Then we finally fell asleep, and a few hours later we were picked up. I told my mom I didn't want to go back because it was too religious for me. I told her we were up a lot of the night praying. I told my mom there was no food also, but since I'm such a picky eater, she was too used to hearing they had nothing to eat, when I really just meant something like they served meatloaf and wouldn't make me a grilled cheese instead. We stopped playing with Ella and just kind of put it behind us until high school, mentioning once every few years, remember that weird religious play date? Since we didn't really understand any of the promises we'd made with Mr. Cyrus, we didn't pay half a mind to keeping them. We were exhausted and surrounded in daily life by Jesus rhetoric that everyone took seriously in the moment, then ignored once the preacher was out of earshot. In high school, it was heavily rumored that Ella's father, Mr. Cyrus, had Florence Hotef, famed for her involvement with the controversial Branch Davidians, visiting his home and leading some sort of prayer circle for him and people from his church. While I still don't know if she really came to visit him, it was all but irrefutably confirmed in high school that Mr. Cyrus belonged to an offshoot of Shepherd's Rod, the Christian apocalyptic extremist group rooted in Seventh-day Adventism. Nobody really talked to them much after that, in town even, because we all considered it a cult. I went out of state after high school, so I have no idea what ever happened with Ella's family, but Mr. Cyrus... Let's not meet again. I'd like to preface this by saying I was young and drunk for most of this, so my bad decision making, while annoying, was not made out of pure ignorance. I was a 20 year old female on an anime convention. My 21st birthday was coming up only a month later, so my roommates decided to let me get shit-faced as long as I stayed in the room or left with someone I trusted. I was staying in a large group of people in one of the nicer hotel rooms there. I had been to quite a lot of conventions and never really had a bad experience. Well, outside of a few cosplay creepers and the occasional shitty person, the weekend went pretty much normally. Except I was really drunk. My group was throwing small parties. On the night of a particularly not-so-fun one, I decided to drunkenly leave the room and go roam about the main lobby. That was when I met Steven. I have no idea how old Steven was, but he was at least an adult, probably a little older than me. We ran into each other at a manga table, and he mentioned how he loved the manga I was holding. I didn't really read manga and just liked the artwork. I'm an anime Andy, after all. But I listened to him gush on about the story for a few. Because, whatever, he seemed nice enough. I didn't say much to him outside of, mm-hmm, and, yeah, that sounds really cool. I thanked him for the info and walked away. After an hour or so of roaming around, I decided to head back up to my room. Back in the room, I had taken two shots with my roommates and was laying on the couch when we got a knock at the door. The music and talking quieted down, as it was customary to shush when someone knocked in case of con security coming to shut down our party. That's when my roommate who answered the door said, Veronica, she's here, come on in. Followed by silence, and then my roommate calling my name and telling me, Someone's here for you. Now, two things drunk me didn't think about were the fact that I didn't tell Steven my name. Our interaction lasted five minutes max, and I gave no information to him at all. On top of that, my name is a bit complicated and hard to pronounce. 
Maybe I assumed he just described me, and my roommate knew who he was talking about. But I definitely didn't give him my room number. No, we were several floors up in the suites area. You'd have to take a different elevator to get to the room than you would to get to a standard hotel room. I wasn't sober enough to think about that, though. I walked to the door. Stephen was standing in the doorway smiling, and he asked me to go for a walk with him. I was so drunk that I said yes. I mean, he's just an awkward anime dude. He probably just wanted a friend to hang out with. We were walking along, and he was talking to me about how he recently was watching an anime when the protagonist wouldn't stop killing the girl he liked. I've since googled that anime plot, and have not been able to find one similar to what he was talking about, outside of some Yandere stuff. I got a bit creeped out, as the hall was completely empty, and we were walking with no plan of where we were going. He then began a spiel about his favorite serial killers, how he was a huge crime junkie, and he followed a lot of cases. A big red flag went off in my head, and I decided it was right about time to try and go back to my room. He stopped walking suddenly, turned and stared at me. I know a really cool spot we can go. If you take the staff elevator, you can go all the way to the top of the hotel. It's really pretty. He was suddenly breathing a little oddly, and his hands started shaking. I said no, as I still had some sense left in my head. He grabbed my arm as hard as he could and started pulling me, yanking me towards the staff doors. I pulled back asking him to stop, and he yelled at me to just be quiet. I yanked free of him and started running. He chased after me, telling me to stop. I was nearly in tears and wondering why the hallways were so empty at one of the most crowded cons I'd ever been to. I finally ran into a group of girls. They saw the fear on my face and immediately pulled me into their group, asking me about my hair and makeup, wrapping their arms around me. I was crying trying to tell them what was happening, but when I looked back, Stephen was already gone. I didn't see him for the rest of the con, but I stopped being so friendly at cons because of him. I would also like to say Stephen is the name I gave him. I never got his own name personally. I told con security about him, and my roommates and friends used the buddy system with me for the rest of the convention. As a female who's been on the game for 15 years now, I've met a load of creeps, but only a few made me feel unsafe. And to start off with, I've always had a laptop ever since I was in high school, a luxury back then that I worked hard to earn with my own money. My mom almost took my hard-earned money for drugs, but luckily money I made in tips was in cash, so it was a lot easier to hide away. At first, my mom was mad I'd bought myself the laptop, but she soon forgot just like everything else. My dad, he could care less, and my older brother already had his own. So, I started playing WoW with him at 14. Back then, girls were unheard of, so I got the usual creeps who usually backed off after hearing my age, though sometimes it was just because they were young too. But not this guy. This guy loved that I was underage. I was about 16 and used to creepy guys at this point, no longer a noob at the game or fending off the creeps. It was no surprise a new guy in the guild started hitting on me right away. Now, I was 16, dumb, young, horny, and stupid, but I knew I wasn't going to find love on WoW, where you knew no one in real life. Plus, at the time, I had this ultimate crush on a guy I couldn't have because he was my brother's best friend. But in my mind, back then, I only wanted him. It was easy to turn down guys, despite being desperate as hell for one. But that all changed after my brother's friend went off to college. I had a part-time job I worked with him, but girls at work always surrounded him, and I became demoralized that I'd never find love. Cute 19-year-old guy on WoW who made me feel wanted. I had a camera phone, so I could send and post pictures at that age, and back then I mostly used Facebook, MySpace, and Photobucket. 
I lost a lot of weight my sophomore year, so I posted confidently bikini pics and sexy pictures thinking I'd lure the attention of my brother's friend, whom was 19. So when this other guy, who was also 19, said he liked me, it didn't faze me. He looked the part in his photos, and his younger brother was around my age, or so I thought. He was extremely attractive in all of his pictures, and even proved it was him in his pictures by holding specific items I'd asked for. He started paying for my WoW subscription, which in the long run, I realized was to get my home address and real name. I was so stupid and heartbroken over my brother's friend, though, that years of teaching myself online safety and the ability to be strong against flirts was all but lost in the head fog. We'd talk for hours on Ventrilo, and he'd make me feel pretty. I was completely blinded by this point. He sent me gifts, and I didn't even question how he knew my address. Then he offered to drive and pick me up, and only then did I suddenly get cold feet. I had a good friend on WoW, someone my brother met at PAX and joined the guild. He's still one of my best friends to this day even, though we both aren't particularly fond of my older brother. He's six years older than me, but he's never tried anything. Honestly, he was more like the brother that I lacked. Well, at least till I was 24 and single for the first time, we did hook up, but that's because we were friends for so long. The distance led to it not turning into anything, though. He caught on to it through conversation, and he acted as my words of wisdom in a time I was lacking any of my own. He saw something fishy when I couldn't. I told my friend I was scared to meet him, because, dumb teenager logic, I thought he wouldn't like me. My friend chimed in, though. You shouldn't meet anyone off the internet at your age. I told him about the gifts, and I swear, I've never been so heavily scolded like this in my life. Not even by my parents. But he always cared like that. He asked me why I would give my address to someone I've never met, and the expensive gifts I was receiving were not something the average 19-year-old would be able to afford. None of this had ever clicked for me, of course, because I was lonely, and trying to prove, uh, I don't know what, to myself, my crush, or something that I could get a boyfriend. Just like that, I told the man it wasn't wise to meet in person, and my parents said I wasn't allowed to. And that's when it turned dark, though. At first, it was just pestering, over and over, guilting me over gifts he'd given me, and encouraging me to defy my parents. While he kept bothering me, though, it never once occurred to me that one day he'd just lose his shit. While my friend was worried shitless about the guy having my address, going as far as to drive the 11 hours to my house and explain the situation to my father, as I'd refused to tell him out of fear of getting in trouble at the time, all the while taking his spring break in my state, instead of his own with his friends. There's a reason he's still one of my best friends. He has a little sister of his own as well, and she's my age, so I guess his protective nature is natural. Eventually, my friend made me block the guy as well, and that was that. This guy was pissed off. He'd go on different accounts to accuse me of gold digging and using him. Luckily though, my friend was smart enough and had the foresight to change my WoW password, even paid for my account for me, taking this guy off it entirely as one of this guy's threats was to delete my account. It didn't end there though. It just got worse. He'd consistently find ways to message me and harass me about how horrible I was until about a month had passed by. I was walking home from school, about a two-mile walk in wealthy suburbs of New England, which I had done for years. Many kids did, as it was a very safe town with no crime in it or the surrounding towns. Without a second thought, I took off with my hundred-pound backpack, maybe an overestimate, and put my headphones in and started my 20-minute walk home. It was very cold, so I had earmuffs over my headphones, only serving to drown out the sound even more. I swear, if I could talk to myself as a kid, I'd probably slap myself all over for this stupidity. Because Wow Guy knew I walked home every day, as I'd talked about it with him constantly. He knew my address, but I'd never thought twice. I was on the back roads walking home, and honestly, Easy to map from my school to home, as it was pretty straightforward, with only one turn. 
At halfway home, in between songs, though, I could hear a vague crunching sound of tires rolling over gravel down the road slowly. I turned around, only to see a tinted black car. This made it so I couldn't see anything of the person in the front. I jogged out of the driveway I was standing in front of, assuming it was someone waiting to turn in. But they didn't turn in. The roads were dead, and it didn't make sense for him to not just go around. I swear, the saying that you go cold when you're terrified is absolutely true. It could have been a warm summer's day at 95 degrees, and my inside still would have been chilly. My heart just sank, and my breathing became uncontrollable. I felt like I had no control over my body, as I realized whoever this was was following me. My blood truly ran cold, and my hand shook as tears formed and my skin felt tight. My body felt like it wasn't ready for fight or flight, but simply instead chose to freeze there and die. It only got worse as the second time I turned my head, I saw the car stop. I stopped. The whole world stopped. I couldn't stop staring, just frozen, breathing like all my school books were over my chest. Crying silently, my eyes hurt with no tears or sound as I just stood there watching. The door opened after what felt like hours, but was probably only a few seconds, or maybe a minute. It was him. It was the attractive man from the photos. Not a catfish, but something seemed very different. At first, I thought it was his angry expression, but I soon realized he was definitely not 19. He must have been at least 30 years old. I could barely think with the sound of my heart racing as it froze me in place. I felt like I was about to throw up as he spoke to me, told me to get in the car and light my house on fire and kill everyone right in front of me. I honestly just couldn't move. I couldn't reach for my phone as his words had scared me still. Yet like magic, we both failed to notice a little old lady on her porch watching the events play out. Suddenly, I heard her call out, You get away from that girl right now, or I'll burn you alive. We both turned to meet her eyes, the pissed off small lady, about 60 or 70, with white hair. I think she noticed my frozen in fear state, as she told me to get over to her quickly. Like that, I ran over to her, tossing up my heavy brick of a backpack. It was obvious he was unsure what to do next, as he stood there and watched me run behind her. I'm sure it must have been quite a sight to see this tiny, thin old lady standing protectively in front of a teenage girl, yelling at a grown man to go away. Like that. Savior number two joined the battle, though, as her husband stepped out. The guy looked like he had been through a war or two, with a shotgun, of all things, and a booming voice. He pointed his gun at the man. I've shot and killed men for lesser reasons. You better leave right now. The man hopped into his car and sped off as I simply collapsed. All that fear just came out as I cried harder and harder. My brain tried to sift through the past few months of mistakes. After calming me down enough to speak in non-hyperventilating words, she asked me if I knew him. I told her kind of, but only online from a video game. I didn't know him in real life. Of course, explaining it like that wasn't easy and her husband couldn't quite grasp what I was talking about. She got on the phone with the school counselor, her daughter, apparently, and told her my name. I was well known to her daughter, ironically. There were only about 250 or less kids in the school, and the town itself was very small. Many staff at our school had family in town as well. The kids were all related to each other by their own children or their siblings' children, it was the kind of town that, if you didn't leave by a certain age, you'd be stuck there forever. Honestly, it seems kind of ironic, but entirely not a huge surprise. The counselor was well aware of my family and my mom's drug addiction, as child services had been involved more than a few times. She came by in ten minutes to pick me up and asked me a ton of questions, of course knowing I didn't want to involve the police, as I was scared of being taken away from my parents yet again. FYI, foster care was worse than a drugged-out mom on prescriptions. We weren't rich, but we were more well-off than many. Though my mom worked, my dad kept my mom on a tight budget to keep her from buying prescriptions from Canada that she wasn't prescribed, hence her trying to take my money. 
She knew all of this and knew, though rough, I was better off than foster care, which was a gamble with losing odds at best. Plus, two more years and I'd be off to college anyway, so we didn't involve the cops. She did make me promise to take the bus every day, though, and to inform my dad of the situation. She also called my dad at work to inform him and had a teacher make sure I got on the bus every day till I graduated, even. It really sucked, but I understood and I was still grateful. If it ended there, it would have been nice, but there's still a bit more. And two days after this, my dad had to fly out for business. My brother was off at college, so it left me with my high mom, who promised my dad she'd stay sober while he was gone. I was used to helping her while she was high, though, and it was like taking care of a child. I was on edge, though, as every creak in that big house from the 60s, cat stirs at night, and dogs barking outside set me on edge. I could barely sleep. My friend from WoW called every night just to make sure I was okay for the past month. I lived out in the middle of the woods, next to a huge river in my backyard, so there was still a lot of wildlife outside in the dead silence of cold months. Running water is, after all, an important source of water when lakes freeze over. I had been used to all of the bumps in the night, cats coming and going, dogs barking at every animal in the yard, but it all seemed new to me as I laid in bed trying to drown out my fears. The house I grew up in was a six-bedroom house. I had a little sister too, but she stayed with my grandma in another state, per court order, while I was allowed to choose due to her only being nine and me being sixteen. The other rooms were used as a game room, office for my dad, and guest room, mostly for when my sister visited my grandma and she had a room. So in a large house like that, in the middle of the woods, it was scary to be virtually all alone because my mom was essentially defenseless. I was letting my last cat inside for the night. At the end of my long driveway, between my neighbor and our house, was parked a black car. I quickly shut the door and locked it after my cat got inside. I made sure all five doors were locked and even put cardboard on the glass doors. Hoping, I guess, that if that was him, it would delay him if he tried to break them. I went and turned off all the lights, got all my cats into one room, so I knew they were safe. Here's the thing about my dog. He's untrained for the most part, but was basically a giant lab puppy in his mind. But he growled at strangers and didn't bark like he did at animals. We had to keep him outside if we had guests, but he never bit anyone, and if you spent enough time around him, he'd eventually accept you. He also didn't growl at all strangers either, so he wasn't the most reliable guard dog either. He was big and had a deep bark. I mulled over what to do as I sat there in the dark with my dog, waiting for shadows to pass by the windows. I eventually went upstairs to my mom's room and woke her up from her sleeping pill stupor. Groggy and still kinda high, she didn't quite grasp what I was telling her until I started crying. She sort of sobered up a bit and asked me to get her some coffee. I did. All the while, I was watching my dog's every move. I could tell he could sense something before I could. As my mom sobered up, the fear in her eyes grew. Eventually, she got the idea to call my neighbors and ask them if they knew the car. After all said no, two of the men went out of their house to check it together. The car was empty. At closer inspection, though, they noticed it was a newer car, a Lexus, and in the passenger seat was a laptop. The car was locked, but with a flashlight, you could see somewhat into the tinted windows. They never told us why, but something they saw in the car prompted them to immediately call the local sheriff. Only one, and he lived in town sort of thing. We were too small to have a police department of our own. He drove over about 15 minutes later, ran the plates, and asked the houses around about it. Apparently, it was a rental car from Ohio. He was calling to see who it was rented to, but he just couldn't find it. He stuck around in his car for about an hour until someone came out of the woods and ran back as the cop turned his spotlight on him. I couldn't see what he was pointing at with his light, as it was the side of my house, and I was looking at the front. I guess he called for backup, as three other cop cars showed up in five minutes from the neighboring town and highway patrol. A lady cop got out, and I asked to speak with her. I was pretty shy back then, but I don't know. Something about a female cop made me feel comfortable to open up to. I told the gist of the story, 
She then called my counselor, who backed it up, also explaining why I was scared of the cops because of my history with foster care. My sober mom joined me and hugged me, doing her typical apologetic routine, but also offering much-needed comfort, as she called my dad, too. Eventually, the lady cop asked if she could take a look around the house to see if things were secure and get any information from my laptop about him. In her search, she found something I hadn't thought about checking. The basement door was not just unlocked, but blown wide open. It's never unlocked, so I didn't even think to check it as our backyard floods in the spring due to beaver dams. It's got extra seals and things to prevent the basement from flooding. Again but the stuff sealing it was mostly sandbags, and all those things had been moved to the side. Thankfully, the door at the bottom of the stairs was still locked, though. It had some damage, like someone had tried breaking it open. He had had access to half of the basement that was storage, though. The door between the sections was like a front door, not an indoor door, as in the summer, my dad left the hatch open to dry out the basement and adjust pool settings, as it was basically the pool house. Upon noticing this, my dad confirmed he had not left it open. My suspicions that the black car was his were pretty much confirmed. As we walked through the house to make sure everything was still safe, she got on my laptop as the others fanned out to search the woods. I gave her everything I had. His photos, username. She even checked to see if his credit card info was still on my account. Unfortunately, it wasn't. The last few digits were, though. She then asked to take my laptop for a few days as she thought she could get some good evidence from it. I asked her to please not damage it and return it as soon as possible because I used it a lot. Before smartphones, it was all I had. After a few hours and onlooking neighbors had gone to bed, the cops came back empty-handed but left a cop outside our house and towed the man's car away. From what the lady told me, what permitted such fear was in the car. There were two guns, some sort of rope, and a pair of handcuffs. The guy who ran back into the dense woods was wearing a winter ski mask as well. So eventually, I tried to lay down and go to sleep, but pretty sure I was going to call out sick tomorrow and kept my cats inside for the day. I was too restless to sleep, of course. Every sound made me too scared. My mom slept with a dog in her room, and my cat slept in my room most nights by choice as my room was usually the warmest. At 3.30 a.m.-ish, I heard a knock at the back door, and I heard a man say, Undercover police officer, open up. I was still awake as I walked downstairs to make out a man standing in the dark with a gun. As he saw me, he demanded I let him in now, as he needed to speak to me. Something fell off. My gut knew it before I did, that this guy's voice seemed forced like someone purposefully making their voice deeper. And just why was he at the back door? I turned on a light outside, and sure enough, it was him. I screamed as quickly as I could. As he heard that, he started pounding the door hard. It wasn't a loud horror movie scream, but more like a gasping scream. I don't think the fear in my body had a loud scream to let out. The banging was pretty loud, though, as I ran to the front to see if the officer was still outside. He was, but he wasn't getting out of his car. I didn't want to run outside as I'm not a fast runner, so I turned the porch lights on and off a couple of times. Still nothing. After a minute, my dog came bolting down to the door, barking and growling, nearly foaming at the mouth. Soon followed by my mom, who yelled she had a gun. She didn't, but a bluff is a bluff, I guess. Somehow, during all of this, the cop outside had snuck around the back of his own car and had his gun pointed at the man, yelling at him to put his gun down. I hid as the rest went down, but he was arrested. No trial needed me to attend, and my statement was enough. Come to find out, he wasn't even American. The car was rented under his friend's name, and after all was done, he was deported back to Canada. I assumed something would prevent him from ever coming back to the USA, as the cop reassured me he would never see me again now. I don't know exactly what he was charged with, but I think my dad said aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, attempted kidnapping, and something else. It also turned out he was 32 years old, not 19, so I assume me being a minor carried a charge as well. Life moved on from there. I had plenty of creeps before and after but he was by far the worst from WoW. I had a couple from streaming as well, but I was an adult, and much better at staying safe online then. 
The only one worse than this was a guy that was my ex-boyfriend's cousin, who made my life hell for years. But that's another story for another time. Back when I was attending a university, I used to work on campus at one of the dining halls during the dinner slash night shift. I lived in the next town over, since it was cheaper to live in a crappy little apartment out of town than to live on campus in the dorms. But I didn't own a car, so I had to take the bus. One night, I had just gotten off a shift at work. My feet were killing me, and I was completely exhausted as I slowly made my way to the bus stop. I noticed a man much older than me sitting on one of the two benches at the otherwise empty stop. I didn't pay too much attention to him. I simply sat down on the second bench and listened to some music while waiting for the bus to arrive. The first sign that things were starting to get weird was when I kept noticing out of the corner of my eye that he was staring at me. At first, I thought I might just be imagining it, so I looked over and caught him quickly turning his head to look away. Okay... So he was staring at me. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary, since being a young college girl seemed to give me a bit of attention from older men. Like I did with the usual creepers, I tried to just ignore him, but that was a mistake. Again, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him gaze over at me, but instead of just staring this time, he got up and walked over to sit next to me instead. I continued listening to my music, hoping that he'd see the earbuds and take the hint that I wasn't interested in having a conversation. Instead, though, this man literally pulled the earbud out of my ear. Hey there, sweetheart, he said, as my head snapped to look at him in shock. I should have told him off for touching my things and demanded he leave me alone, but it was so startling that I was just sort of frozen and didn't want to make him mad. Uh, hi. I replied quietly. He introduced himself as Mike, telling me that he lived in the area and it was always nice to see pretty girls like me at the university bus stop. He explained that he was a real man, unlike the boys I went to school with, and that I should go home with him that night. I was a shy, scared virgin who had never had a man be as bold as this to my face. I say to my face because I certainly had gotten my fair share of unsolicited private pictures online by that point, but I digress. I didn't know how to respond, so I didn't. That didn't stop Mike from continuing to explain to me, though, all of the fun things he wanted to do with me at his place that night. He got into very graphic detail. The things he described started out with the basic things you'd expect but escalated to him asking if I liked being choked until I turned purple and passed out on the bed. I wished there was anyone else at that bus stop, but it was only the two of us, in the dark alone. I counted the seconds until the bus would arrive. Then Mike took things to a different level of shocking by suddenly telling me, Hey, listen, the demons want me to ask for your phone number. They say you should give it to me, or you won't like what happens. He actually had the audacity to start stroking my hair. His hand was gentle, but I didn't want him touching me at all. This was shocking for a number of reasons. The demons. I wouldn't like what would happen. Why was he suddenly touching me? Just what the hell was this guy talking about? As though he could read my mind, he suddenly called out. My therapist. She knows the demons are real. I told her about them. She says that I'm not crazy. They're real. He laughed and then abruptly stopped. Now give me your phone number like they said. He demanded. As his hand stroked my hair for the last time, he stopped and gripped the back of my neck. Still gentle, but even more terrifying. I was scared and obviously didn't want to give him my phone number, but he was taking out his phone and I knew that he was going to call the number I gave him to make sure I wasn't lying. He still had his hand gripped on the back of my neck, so I reluctantly gave him my real phone number. Stupid, I know, but I was right. He immediately called to check. All I could think about was just not making this guy angry long enough to get away from him. Then I'd block his number. Thankfully, the bus came just moments later. I sat down as close to the front of the bus near the bus driver as I possibly could, since the bus was essentially empty. Mike decided, of course, to sit directly across from me. 
At this point, I had tried listening to music again, hoping that being on the bus and him having my phone number would signal to him the end of our conversation. However, at that moment, he decided to reach over and unzip my sweatshirt, revealing my work shirt and the name tag which I had unfortunately forgotten to remove in my haste to leave work that night. I hadn't told him my name yet. Abigail, what a beautiful name. Our daughter, I think she'll be named Celeste. I shouldn't have been shocked at this point, but I was. I had stopped listening to music again and zipped my sweatshirt back up, which made him laugh. You won't need that soon enough anyway. He winked at me, implying how he planned to undress me even further that night. At one stop, Mike tried to convince me to get off the bus with him. I told him no, that I was tired, and that I just wanted to go home. He said okay, and he stayed on the bus with me. I knew that must have been his stop, so the fact that he was staying on the bus worried me. I was sure this meant that he was planning on coming home with me instead. Baby, Mike whispered to me. I tried to ignore him, but he repeated himself louder. He had the most unsettling smile on his face as I asked him what. He laughed. The demons say you smell nice. I was terrified and felt like I was going to throw up by the time the bus stop arrived. I lived in an apartment alone, and I didn't want him to know where I lived. Despite my body being exhausted and sore from work, the adrenaline kicked in, and I bolted off the bus and ran straight home. I made it inside and locked the door. As I looked through the peephole, I didn't see him. I went carefully to peek out my window and saw him standing near the bus stop, gazing around. He took out his phone, and sure enough, I started getting a call from an unknown number since I hadn't saved his. I ignored it. When he hung up, I started getting several texts asking where I'd gone, how he didn't like hide and seek, and how the demons just wanted to have fun, but I was being a little bitch about it. I was so scared because he knew which apartment building I lived in, where I worked, where I went to school, my phone number, and my name. The only good thing that made me feel slightly relieved was that he didn't know which specific apartment I lived in. That's when he started yelling outside. There were no specific words said, just these weird wordless wails of what I can only assume were frustration and anger. I blocked his number and kept all the lights in my apartment off as I cried with my back to the front door. Maybe I should have called the police but my brain was so frazzled that I didn't even think of that until the next day, and by then, all I knew about him was that he was a mentally unstable man, probably named Mike, who hadn't actually done any physical harm to me. I didn't think it was worth it. In hindsight, I know I made a lot of stupid mistakes during this experience. I ended up moving away entirely at the end of that term of school for unrelated reasons, but until then, I switched to day shifts at work and was paranoid every single night. Thankfully, I never saw the man again, though. When I was 17, I lived with my grandparents in a tucked-away suburban neighborhood down in SoCal. I was very social back then, partied a lot, and was out doing something basically every single night getting home anywhere from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. We had only lived there for maybe six months and only had one key. The neighborhood was all old white people and maybe some younger families, all upper middle class. No one drove into our street unless they lived there or knew someone who did. My family was always home, so I never took the sole house key and the front door and backyard sliding door were always unlocked. This was so that I could come home at any time of the night and then just lock it behind me. My husky dog slept outside as well and liked to come in and out as she pleased, which is the main reason the slider was always open at night. I'll circle back to why mentioning my dog is important in a bit. Fast forward to a random night. I was out with a friend of mine. No recollection of what we did that night. and Probably went to someone's house and did a bunch of coke until 3 a.m., she drives me home, I don't drive, and drops me off at about 3.45. I say bye, head inside, and lock the door behind me. I go into the kitchen and pop a cup of noodles in the microwave. About five minutes later, I go upstairs to my room. My room is on the second floor, directly above the garage and driveway. 
Looking out, you see about 50 yards away, the entrance to my street, which was shaped like the letter P, so anyone who drove into my street I could clearly see. They would have to loop around and pass by our house to leave via the same road. This is when I looked out of my window and saw them. My lights were already on, and my curtains were already drawn from when I left in a hurry earlier. I walked up to the window to shut them, looked down into my driveway, where between my grandparents' four parked cars stood a very large man staring right up into my window, dead still with a blank stare. He was Hispanic, late 20s to early 30s, about 6 foot 2 and probably at least 250 pounds. I immediately dropped to the floor, but there's no way he didn't already see me. As I dropped, I saw another man walking out from my gate, which is not visible from my window, next to the driveway, coming out from inside, towards the other man. I heard some brief speaking from the man who came out of the gate, and couldn't understand what language it was, but it was not English. Oddly enough though, it didn't sound Spanish either. After I dropped to the floor, I crawled to my grandpa's office, which sat directly next to my room and had a window that also faced the driveway. The lights were off in there, so I could look out without being seen. The man who I saw standing between our cars was still standing there, staring motionless into my room. The other man was looking around and pointing to my house. I nearly vomited. I crawled to my grandparents' room down the hall. I was crawling because the upper level was loft style, where you can see the whole lower level and out of the glass front door and windows. I frantically knocked on their door, trying to stay quiet as to not tip off these men, because I wanted them to be caught and questioned by the police. My grandparents finally woke up and could barely understand me because I was shaking so badly and the words were just spilling out. My grandpa, being the fearless, grumpy old man he is, put on his robe and decided to walk outside and investigate himself. I called the cops and watched from the upstairs window to make sure nothing happened. By the time he went outside and stood in the driveway, though, the men were already gone from my sight. A few moments later, a car sped out of our street, lights off, and no license plate. He told me once he came back inside that when he had gone out, they were parked next to my neighbor's car in their driveway, with the car on but lights off and the seats reclined. He said it looked like they were sleeping, or at least pretending to. When they looked over and saw him, though, they backed down and sped off. The cops took a whopping 30 minutes to show up, didn't want my descriptions of the men or the car. They said lock the doors and if they came back to call again. They drove around my street once and then left. Great. Thanks for the help. My grandma thought I was just on drugs and didn't feel the level of urgency or danger that I felt. My grandpa was also very nonchalant, even though he saw them. This pissed me off and made me feel even more helpless. I slept on the floor of their room from that night on until about three months later. That wasn't the end, though. So, my husky. Her name is Nala, and at the time she was about two. She's small for a husky, only about 50 pounds, but to people who aren't super familiar with dogs, she looks very threatening. She chose to always sleep outside, which is why we always left the slider in the backyard open. Literally always. My grandparents would get pissed when I would close and lock it, because she'd piss and shit all over the house. Anyway, about a month or so before that night I saw those men, I was in the backyard and saw Nala chewing on something. She has possession aggression with certain things like bones, small animals, and things she's stolen. That basically means when you go near her and she's in that state, she growls, flashes her teeth, snarls, and lunges. If you dare to reach her hand out as if to take what she has, you'll lose it. When I walked up to her, she lunged at me. She had a steak. A rotten, moldy, obviously old T-bone steak. It looked like she'd been working away on it for a while. I asked my grandparents, and they didn't give it to her. I asked my neighbors if they maybe threw her one over the fence. They had no idea either. At first, I didn't think anything of it. But then, it happened four more times. 
four separate occasions. I found her with a rotten meat clinging to the bone T-bone steak. I threw them away each time I found them, so I knew they were new. I asked my neighbors again, thinking maybe they thought I was mad they were giving my dog food and lying to me. Nothing. Hmm. Like I said, this was coincidentally happening in the weeks leading up to that night I saw those men. After that event, though, it made me start to connect the dots between the stakes she was finding and these people. I fast forward to about three months after that initial event. I hadn't slept in my room since, and I went on a trip to Europe to visit some family for a month. Nothing had happened since that night, but the trauma and fear were very real. It made me lose weight. I stayed up all night listening to every noise I heard and analyzing it, peeking out the windows every couple of minutes until 6 a.m. I was a wreck. While out of the country, I came to terms with everything in my own mind and decided I had to stop living like how I was, in constant fear. What were those men going to do to me if I hadn't seen them? They wanted to break in and rob us. Most all of us were gone during the day, most days a week for at least a few hours. Why wait for everyone to be home? If they were peeping toms, they could have parked on my street and watched me all night, and I would have never known. I think they were going to try to take me. Trafficking, maybe? I should mention that I am a model. Not a very well-known one. I do have a decently big social media following, though. I do a lot of live streams. I'm very interactive with my followers, and have been in the spotlight online since I was 13. I got back from Europe, and about a week or so later, I decided I was going to finally go out again. It was the first day where I really felt okay, and not so afraid. I got used to things being normal again, and was excited to move on from the whole thing. So, that night I went out. I got home a little earlier this time, about 1 to 2 a.m., and I also brought my key with me. Started locking the doors after that night, after all. My friend waited for me to go through my gate and get to my door before leaving. As I pulled out my keys and walked up to the door, though, I heard a rustling in the bushes. Oh, I am just being paranoid. There's no way that's anything but an animal. To help get a better picture, he walked through a three-foot-tall swing-open gate, adjacent to the driveway, and about six steps down a path to the front door, and a small three-foot gate to the backyard is adjacent to the front door to the left. When I heard the rustling, I instinctively flashed my unlocked phone screen in that direction for a light to look into the pitch-black backyard. At that exact moment I did, someone about four feet in front of me in my backyard flashed their phone screen as if they were investigating the same way I was. I didn't see the person, just the screen, which had a text conversation open on it. I noted that it wasn't an iPhone. I let out a gasp, and they whipped around the corner back into the backyard. I bolted inside the front door. I ran to the back slider and slammed and locked it, then ran upstairs while calling the police. That entire interaction outside happened in about 10 seconds. The police showed up and did nothing at all like before. After talking with them for a while, I went upstairs to my room and peered out the window as they spoke to my grandparents. As I was scanning the street from the window, I heard a whistling coming from directly below me. It was that whistle people do when trying to get someone's attention, or when calling your dog to you, as if communicating with his buddy, saying, The cops are here. Let's dip. My theory about the stakes is that these men were stalking me and casing our house for at least a month before I saw them that first night. They must have seen my dog and not knowing that she doesn't bark or attack strangers, baited her with stakes to gain her trust so they could go into the backyard without a problem. We moved a couple of months later due to something unrelated. I never saw them again, and to this day, I still struggle with PTSD those events caused me. I have lived in constant fear and paranoia ever since, and I can't be alone at night at all. I think the reason it affects me so much is because they were never caught. Who knows what their end goal was? And the worst part for me, how the fuck did they even find me? Did they follow me home from seeing me somewhere in the public one night? Were they some gardeners who often mowed the lawn around me as I laid out and tanned? Were they some of the workers that redid our roof for weeks on end a month or so before this happened? I'll never know. 
And it kills me. Honestly, I still hear that fucking whistle every now and then. I think it might be auditory hallucinations at this point. I don't know. And two and a half years ago, I was what you might call the right hand for my boss who owned the motel that I worked for, technically is a head housekeeper, but I had recently begun training to run the full spectrum of the motel, including all things office and front desk, overseeing staff and minor maintenance, so my boss could take a vacation. It was a 42-room mom-and-pop place, set back off the road, so it was pretty peaceful for the most part. There were still a few motley ones every now and then, but hey, that's at any motel in a small town in the USA. But as intimidating as the new responsibility sounded, with only two other staff members to worry about, well, the day comes for the boss to take her leave, and I'm now in charge of her life's blood, sweat, and tears, pumped up for the opportunity to show just what I was made of. She left Friday morning, and the rest of the day ran like clockwork, until around 8.30 that night. I also lived on the property in an apartment, which allowed me to run back and forth to the office for guest check-ins and any office duties I needed to attend to. So when the ring the doorbell alerted, I looked at my phone and saw an older gentleman, early 60s maybe, staring through the door looking for an attendant. I spoke through the camera to let him know I'd be there in 30 seconds and started on my way to the office. As I would with any guest while checking them in, I made small talk about his trip and gave the lowdown on where the good food in town was. I got him squared away in the computer and showed him how to get to his room. As he was getting his credit card situated back in his wallet, I thanked him for staying with us and called him Mr. Logan. He looked up at me and smiled and said I should call him Joe. Then he made his way out of the office. Less than 30 minutes had passed and I get a call from room 135, Joe's room. He proceeds to tell me that he would like to use the desk lamp, but there's no light bulb in it. He proceeds to tell me that he would like to use the desk lamp, but there's no light bulb in it. Could he please get one? Which immediately threw up a red flag. I had cleaned that room myself, and I made it a habit to check every light bulb in the room. I knew for a fact the bulb was there, because I had used the desk lamp as I was cleaning. I told him I would bring one down. He immediately said he would rather come to the office to get it. The office was attached to an apartment-type space that my boss lived in during the week, and it was very dark in the back, set up in a way that would have made it very difficult, if not impossible, to see through the door to the apartment, considering I was the only employee on the property. Having him come to my very secluded office in the dark just wasn't going to happen. I felt more comfortable taking it to his room. This was an old drive-up style setup where I knew there were other guests around that area that were sitting outside and could help me if I needed it. When he said he would rather come to the office, I told him I would have to bring it down to him because my boss would kill me if I made a guest change a light bulb. He said he understood and I felt I could breathe a little easier. He's not going to get me cornered in my secluded office to do God knows what. I grabbed the bulb, but before I can even get to the front door, I look. And there he is, peeking through the glass on the door, staring me down in the most unsettling way. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I physically started shaking. I opened the door and just said, Let's get your lamp working nice and right. I started walking past him. He then said he thought he forgot to sign his credit card receipt. Can we go and double check for a moment? I tell him I had already dropped the receipt, but that I would check in the morning and get it from him if I needed it. That was total crap. He made a big deal about finding his good pen to sign it with, but we both know he signed it. With that rejected idea, he continued to his room. As I walked in, I kicked the doorstop wedge that I brought with me under the door so I couldn't close without assistance. Then had he tried, I would have had time to yell for help from the guys next door to him. I think he figured that out and stepped away from the door as I walked in. As I put the bulb in the lamp and turned to leave, I noticed the original light bulb sticking halfway out from under the couch pillow. 
I picked up my pace, chose to say nothing, and left. I made sure that he didn't see where I went, because I sure didn't want him to know that I lived there, or which apartment was mine. Thirty minutes later, the phone rings again. Of course, it's Joe. This time, he would like extra coffee for in the morning. I tell him I'm unable to get into the housekeeping supply room, because the housekeeper accidentally took it home. Total lie. But I wasn't going to go back over there. Something about him had me legitimately scared. He called two more times that night, but I changed my voicemail to the motel's information and let him leave a message. I never even checked them. I never even checked them. Bad customer service for my first night running the place alone, but I really didn't think my boss would entertain the idea of penalizing me after she'd heard the whole story. The next morning starts out quiet as usual. I was running on it when Joe shows up at the door. I wasn't scared this time because one of my housekeepers was getting coffee in the kitchen, and there were people coming and going and checking out as well. Joe asked me to go to breakfast with him. I explained that I'm on the clock and have business to keep afloat for my boss, but thank you for the offer. I'm not exactly sure what went down in this next two hours because I was working, but somewhere in there, Joe's car quit working. He was trying to go to the next town over, which is significantly bigger than my town, for one reason or another. Anyway, he starts getting unreasonably angry that his car won't start, saying things like, How am I supposed to do this without a fucking car? And whatnot. Then it dawns on him that there's a car dealership next door, and he starts off in that direction. Before he gets too far away, though, he sees me coming out of a room and says, You're gonna marry me. Just wait and see. We're going to Vegas, all while smiling and chuckling. I chuckled too because there's no way he's being serious. I hoped. I continued on with my day. About five hours passed and I get a phone call from the dealership asking if Mr. Logan had checked out. I said he was booked for one more night. He proceeds to tell me that Joe took a car for a test drive and was supposed to return in 30 minutes, but hadn't done so and wasn't answering phone calls either. They asked if I could check his room to see if his belongings were still there. I obliged. I opened his door, after knocking with no response, and found the room completely destroyed. Papers all over the place, trash on the floor, pictures off the wall, the whole nine. But I wasn't sure if the papers were something he would come back for, or if he bailed and just left all this stuff behind. Aside from all the garbage strewn about, the only other personal belongings were a pair of swim trunks and a pair of socks. Again, was that worth coming back for? I told the dealership that I'm not 100% sure, so they call the police. After another couple hours, the police show up at the motel, Joe in tow. I had decided since he paid up until the next day, I would just leave his stuff there in case he returned, which honestly I didn't think would happen. He goes in and starts taking his things out of the room. That's when the cop comes up to me, and being a small town, he knows me and pulls me aside. He says to me, Chaotica, you need to thank God every night that you're still alive and well and here. I was very confused. Okay, but what makes you say that? That man had every intention of taking you with him tonight and going somewhere you'd never be looked for in. I don't know that he would have let you live even. He's a sick man. We're taking him in for a psyche eval and then to the county if he's okay for general population. He then told me I should call my boss and let her know what was happening. Maybe take my own vacation for a few days, just in case they can't make the car theft thing stick, since the dealership no longer wanted to press charges, given his newly found psychological state. That was technically also the only law he broke. They also said they would patrol the motel every hour or so to check in on me if he was released. I was completely taken aback. To this day, I wonder how he planned on getting me out of there, and what he was going to do if he did. He was released after only 24 hours, but thankfully I never saw him again. And to be honest, I'm okay with that. Alaska is the perfect place to go if you want to get away from the rest of the world. 
As America's least densely populated state, you have plenty of breathing room from any kind of authority or prying eyes that may want to know what you're up to. For this reason, my home state is very attractive to all sorts of weird and unsavory groups. I've stumbled across Scientology centers at the end of a dirt back road, with nothing else for miles around. Heard stories from doomsday preppers, who claimed to have bunkers made out of shipping containers in the sides of mountains, and even met people who have come out of religious cults in the interior that wanted to keep their followers away from any contact with the outside world. All this and more you can find in Alaska. I was born and raised in Anchorage, the only big city in the state. Growing up, we had about 250,000 people in a city it takes about 30 minutes tops to drive across, so that gives you a good idea for what we up north consider a big city. The only other real city in the entire state is Fairbanks, really. And these two cities are connected by 360 miles of two-lane highway. It's about a seven-hour drive one way to get between them, through the most beautiful landscapes on the planet. The mountains rise up on either side of you, between Anchorage and Denali National Park, before you drive through these colossal canyons, carved out of the rock over tens of thousands of years by melting glaciers and rivers. Uh, past Denali is another three hours of driving, through a vast, flat interior plain, with mountains far off in the distance. Uh, I say this all to help you understand just how desolate it feels in Alaska, even when you're riding out on the highway. After you get out of Anchorage or Fairbanks, there's nothing but wilderness as far as the eye can see, save for the occasional small town with a max population of about a thousand people on a good day. And ten years back, it was even less. Alaskan girls are built tough. We change tires, hunt, fish, camp, and generally have a great appreciation for the outdoors that women in the lower 48 don't really have if they're near a big city. The joke is that Anchorage is the biggest rural city in the country. All this brings context to the following story. In high school, things were a bit different. Or at least they felt like they were. I was a young and stupid woman who thought I could conquer anything due to the aforementioned built-tough attitude I was raised with my whole life. Senior year of high school, I decided I wanted to treat myself to a camping trip up in the mountains past Talkeetna. Nothing fancy, just an overnight or two in the most beautiful state at the most beautiful time of the year, mid-June. Going up north in peak summer here always has a weird feeling to it. It feels like the sun never really sets. If you've ever seen the movie Midsummer, uh, that's what it's like. It gets to about dusk, but that's it. It's still bright and sunny out the entire night through. Uh, shout out to readers in the far north of Scandinavia and Greenland. The false sense of security I had, thinking that the midnight sunlight would mean safety, probably nearly got me killed, or maybe even worse. My second mistake was not telling anybody where I was going. I just suddenly one day packed up from my trip, stopped at Subway for lunch, and headed out to the great beyond. The drive was pretty fine. A solid 2.5 hours of driving north along the highway took up most of the afternoon, as I jammed out to the greatest hits on the radio on Cool 97.3. After you get through the Matsu Valley, you get into the mountains once again. And tall spruce and evergreen trees line the road on both sides, with the occasionally empty space where there's been some clear-cut logging. All of this helps to give you a sense that, while you're far out in the wilderness, you're still connected to civilization in some way. And this led me to my biggest mistake not staying at a state park campground. I was in high school with only a part-time job, and I didn't want to pay the $15 overnight camp fee. I was too scared to risk a fine as well, so I found a spot that looked good and pulled off the road. The map I got from my dad said there was an old mining site up a nearby mountain, so I decided that would be the best spot to head to for an overnight. My logic must have been that it was badass to spend a night in a mining ghost town, or something like that at least. 
pulled off the road, packed up my backpack, put on some bug spray, grabbed my map and compass, and started off into the woods. This hadn't been the first time I had done this, of course. I'd been on wilderness backpacking trips on my own with my dad through childhood. I knew my orientation skills, and had taken some wilderness survival courses at camp. I wasn't just some dumb blonde wandering off into the woods with no idea of where I was. At least I thought so. A solid 45 minute hike up into the hills, and I finally made it to where the old mining camp was supposed to be. There was nothing there though. Just an old concrete foundation with a bunch of holes in it and nothing else. I was disappointed but unsurprised at the outcome. I set up camp off in the woods and set to building a fire for dinner on the concrete slab. Here, you're supposed to set up cooking a ways off from your camp, just in case the bears get a little nosy. The last thing you want is a 1300 pound grizzly poking his nose in your tent, wondering why you smell like Campbell's soup and s'mores. By this time, it was getting quite late, about 10 p.m., but the sun was still high in the sky, and by the time dinner was over, it was nearly 11. I was starving, and I dug in. About an hour later, it was about as dark as it was ever going to get, so I hunkered down in my tent for the night, confident that the overgrowth was private enough for whatever animals might come out around then. Suddenly, I woke to voices in the distance, and slow-moving crashing throughout the underbrush. My first thought was hunters. My dad and I had run into a few on some campouts, so it wasn't really uncommon. I relaxed, and figured they would just pass through without incident. I closed my eyes once again. That's when they found my fire pit. A man's voice cried out into the brightish forest. Hey, who the fuck is camping on our property? I froze. I knew I had fucked up, and was getting up and grabbing my purse, putting on my shoes so I could go apologize. But then I heard the man again. When we find you, you're fucking dead. You're on private militia property, and all trespassers get shot. That's when the whole situation changed. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't just pack up my tent and shit with some armed guy lurking around. I carefully put my shoes on, put my keys in my purse, and slunk away into the underbrush as quietly as I could. My thought was to slip away, wait until they got bored and left then go back, pack up, and leave. I spent 20 minutes hunkered down behind a log in the woods, barely an earshot, before I heard a second voice calling out for others. They had found my tent, and were tearing everything apart going through my stuff. I heard one shout out, The bed's still warm. Another called back, The trespasser's a chick. She left her underwear. The first man shouted out again, Okay, fan out and find her. Bitch thinks she can trespass? then there's going to be hell to pay. At that point, I wasn't concerned that I had left my spare change of underwear in my bag, or that these creeps had found it. I needed to get out of here. Quietly, I made my way down the mountain for a good 30 minutes, tiptoeing and taking care not to step on any twigs or make any ruckus. After the rustling and shouting of the men through the underbrush had faded quite a bit, I said fuck it, and booked it as fast as I could in the midnight sun down the hills. I tripped, fell, and got scraped up more times than I care to remember. Finally, I made it back to the road, but much to my horror, there was no car. I knew I had come out up or down the road from where I had been. I just couldn't quite remember where I was at the time. I picked a random direction and started walking. I rounded a corner on the road eventually and saw my car with two armed men standing watch beside it. They were all armed heavily and dressed in surplus military gear. I hid in the brush on the side of the road and watched for quite a long time. Eventually, several more men appeared from the trail I had taken. They dumped all of my stuff next to my car, hopped back on their ATVs, and just drove off into the night. I went up to my car, careful not to be seen, and found a note on my dashboard. If we ever catch you on our property again, we won't hesitate to use force. Consider this a polite warning. I went back to start loading stuff into my car and noticed what they had done. They'd cut up or destroyed all of my gear, probably as punishment for trespassing. Honestly though, I'm thankful they did that, because at least I didn't get shot. Ever since then, I've taken great care to camp only in designated camping areas. 
and to the weird Alaskan militia group. I know you weren't actually going to kill me, but nevertheless, let's not meet again. At the time these events transpired, my brother, my father, and I, 16 and male, are road tripping through Nevada and California as my graduation gift. It was the end of August, and after a long trip coming from Vegas, cruising through Los Angeles, and heading north across California, we decided to stay in beautiful Santa Barbara for a few days. My father finds a motel not too far from the beach, and we're all in wonder as to the movie-like beauty of the city we're staying in. In the evening of our first night there, being back to the motel shortly after feasting on greasy and savory pizza from Rusty's Pizza Parlor, and walking along one of the most beautiful beaches in the USA, I started to get a bit bored in my room. After having watched the television with my father and brother for about an hour, to change the scenery a bit, I decided to peek through our room window. As I kneeled on the raspy purple carpeted floor and drew the thick and heavy curtains out, a sense of dread took over my whole being. I was startled by the thing I see right across the street, only about a hundred feet from my window. What I'm looking at is at odds with the beautiful picture-like frame created by the motel lobby entrance arc, delimiting it from my field of view. A beautiful shadow and light setting, created by the streetlight beam on the pavement on the other side of the road, revealed a man whose physical traits were hooded by the shadows cast by the downward light. Right under the streetlight, he was standing half in the light, half in the dark of the night, as if knowing the effect of the lighting had on him. He looked like he was in his late twenties, early thirties possibly, and stared right at me, his gaze like a laser beam. I could feel it all the way down to my kidneys. I couldn't see crazy eyes from this distance, but I could just feel that energy, and my subconscious picked up on the intent, which was definitely not good. He seemed to have been waiting for me to look at him for a long time, as if he somehow knew what would happen. Kind of like how you know you'll always hear thunder after seeing lightning. A few seconds after he was made aware of my awareness of his presence, still staring at me, he starts in a slow motion clockwork motion, sliding his index finger sideways across his throat, underneath his jaw from left to right, over and over again, silently telling me, I'll kill you, that's right, I'll kill you. The floor beneath me starts to sink, and a taste of metal overwhelms the top of my tongue. I close the curtains as quick as if my life depends on it. I turn my body away from the window, towards my father, and tell him the weird thing I've just seen. He seems to shrug it off, talking over the baseball game on TV, and tells me to just let it go. But I can feel, along with his calm vibe of arrogant carefulness, a hint of uneasiness that I could just taste in the back of my mouth. Thirty seconds go by. I kneel uncomfortably again on the motel carpet just below the windowsill. After loudly swallowing for luck, against my better judgment, I draw the curtains out a second time. This time, my hands stop at the width of my head, allowing it to view just enough of the outside world to be able to grasp what's happening outside of my safe motel room. There he is again, only this time... The man was standing two-thirds of the way to where he stood the first time I'd seen him. His facial traits were now darkened by the lack of a streetlight, but I could still feel that crazy energy. He was now under the motel lobby parking lot arch. There was not much light where he stood, but I could still perceive him doing his throat-slicing gesture. I started feeling uneasy and frightened. I closed the curtains quickly once again, and told my dad again of the man's presence and his approaching of our room. I get on the bed, trying to concentrate on the TV, to forget what I've just seen. I don't remember if my dad looked through the window to confirm what was happening. I remember him telling me to stop looking outside, though, if what I see is scaring me. We were all safe in the room, which was locked. After what seems like a few minutes passing, I peek for the last time... This time, the man is right in the parking lot, only 50 feet or so from our motel room, 
doing the same gesture once again. I start thinking the man is probably just mentally ill or something, that I'd better stop looking out the window again. A clever thing to do, I tell myself. The man's behavior, although weird, struck me as being ominous and threatening. The night goes on with that feeling that even if I'm probably safe, there's this disturbed man missing a few cogs who's got nothing to lose right outside our room. As far as I know, he could be leaning on the window glass a few minutes from now if this keeps going. Would he be grinning or not? Would he raise his arm to gently tap on the window while kneeling underneath the sill? I try not to think about it. I slept uneasily that night. The following morning, not wanting to go outside the room, I decide to stay in with my brother, while my father goes to the motel lobby to fetch orange juice, breakfast, and to speak to the motel clerk about the man outside. My father comes back after a couple of minutes with our breakfast, and tells me that the clerk had told him the guy who frightened me the night before was known around the area for his mental illness. He was probably a schizophrenic. My dad also reassures me that the clerk told him the man was not dangerous, and we were safe staying there for another couple of nights. Luckily, I didn't see the man again for the duration of our stay there. Fast forward a couple of years. My father and I were reminiscing about our trip to California, especially those days spent in Santa Barbara. When the mentally ill man threatening me with his finger outside our motel room was mentioned in the conversation, my father, as if relieved from not having to keep a secret anymore, lets out that the morning after that night, the motel clerk had in fact told him to be careful with that man. He was in fact dangerous and very violent. My dad just didn't want to scare us by telling us the truth. I thanked him for lying to me that morning, and we agreed that luckily... We never saw the man again during our stay there. So this happened when my friend and I were 15 years old. We both lived super close to each other, so I'd often go to her place after school to do homework and hang out. A little info. Her house has a park that pretty much backs up to it, and a side entrance to the park is literally right next to her house. It's typically only used by people in the neighborhood, but you're immediately in the thickest part of the woods when you enter from that entrance. It was a Friday, and we didn't really have any homework for the weekend. Her mom had dropped us off at the house, and left to do errands, so we decided to go on a walk with her dog. We live in a very good neighborhood with low crime, and we were very familiar and comfortable with this park. And plus, there being two of us with a dog during the day, we weren't all that worried. So we change out of our school uniforms, get some hiking shoes on, and make our way to the park entrance. We start our walk, and the day is a perfect day for being outside. We instantly fall into comfortable conversation as we head off to our favorite part of the woods. Sorry if this is confusing, but I'll try to explain the trail as best as possible. There's a couple of miles of winding, paved trail until we run into the first split. If you go left, it'll lead you to the main park area with swings, restrooms, picnic area, all of that stuff. If you go right, it leads to a bridge that will take you to another trail option. We went right to head over to the bridge, since the trail we wanted was over that way. This is where things got weird. We began making our way over to the bridge, when we saw a jogger heading in our direction. We both moved to the side to let him pass, but I suddenly got just a really bad feeling. You know the one. Your hair standing up on ends, heart speeding up, a true sense of alarm just by this person's aura. He passed us, and stared back at us from over his shoulder a while. I mostly decided, though, that I was being overly paranoid, where he was staring at the dog because who doesn't like a cute-looking dog? After all, he seemed like a pretty average person and was not threatening-looking in general. Still, I tucked it in the back of my mind just to stay a little bit more aware of our surroundings this time. We continued on our walk, which led to another of two trail options. A left continues as a paved area, and off to the right is a dirt trail that's well overgrown in some spots. We took the right because it was deeper into the woods, and it was where our hangout spot was. 
Our spot is completely off the dirt trail, and we have to walk across a log over a small part of the creek just to get to it. Not many people know about this area, which is why we liked it so much. Most people don't even take the dirt trail at all unless they're bird watching or taking nature photos. We get to our spot, and we hang out a bit just chatting about life. We both didn't have the best home life, and crazy mothers to put it mildly so it was nice to be able to chat with each other about stuff in privacy. Maybe ten minutes after we made it to this spot, we heard a branch snap at a distance from us. From where we were, we could just make out that someone was walking along the dirt trail, but whoever it was wouldn't have an easy view of us. We looked over, and my heart just stops. I could just make out the runner from the bridge coming through the trees. He had on bright red shorts so it was easy to tell it was him. Immediately, though, we both knew that something was not right. This wasn't the kind of trail someone out on a run would take ever. He obviously turned around on his run to head back in our direction. He had originally come from the paved trail that we didn't take earlier, so our alarm bells started ringing. He walked past our spot and quietly continued down the dirt trail, no longer running like he was trying to be quiet. We were at a decent distance, and thankfully he was keeping his gaze forward, or he might have definitely seen us. My friend and I were silently watching. When he was out of view, she turns to me and says, We need to go now. Yeah, something doesn't feel right about that guy. My friend just nodded. She let her dog off the leash. She's very good at following, and she would be able to move faster without the lead. So would we. I do have to mention that this dog would not be helpful at all if the situation escalates, because she failed at being a service dog. She was too overly friendly to strangers, i.e. she couldn't stay focused on her tasks. She was very obedient, but everyone was considered a friend. So no help coming from her. He hadn't even been deterred from seeing her to begin with, as she was just a smaller yellow lab. We took off at this point, trying to be quiet and fast, because we will have to cross over the dirt trail that he was on, and we don't want him coming back and seeing us. My friend falls, scrambling across the log into the creek. I slip at the end, so both of us now have very waterlogged shoes. We panicked because of the noise. We just took off, knowing that we had already made a ton of noise anyway. We didn't run back to the paved area, because we were too deep into the woods at this point, and a straight shot was our best bet. Very quickly, we started to hear a noise coming from behind us. She yelled out to me, He's following us! I'm not a runner, but adrenaline saved the day, because I could have run a marathon with how scared I was. We were crashing through the bushes, not following any sort of trail at this point, but heading in the direction we needed to go to get out of the woods and closer to her house. We had to have been running for at least 15 minutes, and most of the time my friend was yelling directions to me from behind, because she could see the man chasing us. I'm clumsy, and I knew if I looked back that I'd be the idiot to trip like in the movies. At some point, we either lost him or he gave up but we finally broke through the woods into the field between the woods and the houses in her neighborhood. We jogged close to the fences heading to her house, scanning the edge of the woods and trying to get oxygen back into our lungs. We never saw anything once we made it out of the woods, but we wouldn't feel safe until we got back inside her house. We were a complete mess. She was soaked up to her thighs, and I was soaked up to my calves. At one point, I wrapped my hands around branches coated with thorns, so my hands were full of cuts and were bleeding. She had some rips in her pants and shirt. Her dog was perfectly fine, though, because she didn't fall into a creek like an idiot and avoided all the thorns. We immediately started talking, and she said she had the same creepy feeling about the man, too, but didn't say anything at the time. She said she noticed that he had given her dog a kind of dirty look, which made her feel very uncomfortable. She had also caught a few glimpses of his face while we were running away from him, and she said he looked absolutely livid. Her mom got home, and we told her what happened. Now, her mom is not someone I'm a fan of. She merely tells us that he was probably an off-duty cop, coming to check on us to make sure we were okay since we were two young girls alone in the woods. Neither of us bought her explanation, but she managed to make us feel like idiots. I never mentioned anything to my mom because she would have just blamed us for going on a walk by ourselves, so nothing ever came of it. 
That was also the last time we went into those woods, just the two of us. We only ever went with a group of friends or her older brother after that, but we never saw the man again. As an adult, I realize how truly messed up the situation was. The man had to have been six foot two and in his forties. I was only five foot one and my friend was five foot three. We looked even younger than fifteen because I still had people at restaurants automatically giving me a child's menu whenever we went out to eat. There wasn't really any excuse for a grown man following two young females into a secluded part of the woods when we were very obviously scared of him. It's been over a decade now, and we live in the same neighborhood and frequent the park. The dirt trail is now paved, and a lot of the trees have been cleared away. I still to this day, though, can't go to this park without looking for that man again, or keeping a constant lookout for someone starting to follow me. I truly hope I never meet this creep again, even though so much time has passed.